Hey everyone, welcome. We've got uh, still people streaming in, but we're going to keep going. Uh, I'm not going to do formal instru- uh, introductions of these guys. They're they're all juggernauts in their roles. Uh, I'm not going to read their backgrounds, but I will give you who they are. You got Josh Miller, who's the president of Rainbow. I've uh, known Josh for a long time, and, and he's representing not only the small franchise, the large franchise, but the whole organization. Uh, we got Brian Newell, amazing experience in the large loss world. Uh, and when we call him large loss, it's probably like the mega loss. Uh, so he's going to bring some of that experience in here. And then we got Chris Elliott from uh, Blue Sky, VP of Blue Sky. And I'll tell you, one of the amazing things about him is their network is doing all kinds of residential, healthcare, commercial. So we're going to have a different experience from him as well. But the combined experience of all three of them, uh, I'm really excited about this session. Uh, it's hard to get these types of caliber of people together uh, to do these events. We've been working on it for six years to try to get everyone together and we finally did it. So we're going to keep that off and get going. Uh, Today, what we're going to do is we're going to cover off um, a little bit in here. Let me switch the, uh, get the PowerPoint running for us. We're going to go through it and we're going to do it a little different. It's going to be more like a, a discussion uh, as opposed to a lesson of what we normally do in our boot camps. And that's just because we've got so much experience here that you can't put it into a PowerPoint and actually deliver it well. But we are going to go in through a series of starting to walk you through getting ready for a cat. Uh, we're going to do the cat prep, uh, then financial readiness. What do you have to think about when you're doing uh, this type of work? Uh, what happens if you want to do at home, like you have a hometown cat, how is that a little bit different than mobilizing, going on the road and all the concerns you do with that? We're going to talk about documentation, making sure that you uh, get your information set up uh, and prepared, uh, estimating and pricing some of those concerns about how are we charging customers, where are some of the pitfalls of that, and then we're going to go to closing out the uh, job, getting paid, closing out your cat, you know, getting back home, and then some of the the people aspects that come with this. So you know, cat work is is fast and furious. Uh, there's a high burnout rate on on people that are working in this field so we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through this as well just to put a full uh, uh, perspective together now we're going to start off our first section which is preparing for cats and i'm and we're going to get into the discussion here i'm going to bring in josh um sort of one of these things is is when we look well josh or anyone else that wants to answer but when we look at costs uh preparing for the cat it's a mindset and so it's a mindset of you know, are you just mobilizing? Someone says, hey, we got claims in, in a different city. You want to go. How are you prepared for it? Have you put a plan in place? And so when we start talking about preparedness, uh, we're going to start talking about when do you go and, and how do you roll out? Now, one of the interesting things is, is that w- when we were discussing, the four of us were together and discussing it, it's interesting when you start to look at how many people mobilize without a plan, without a purpose, without relationships, without any planning, just grab the, the trailer and start rolling out and we're going to get some work. And, and that's not necessarily a strategy that will pay off, although it has paid off for some and it's paid off fairly well for others. But when you're getting in there and we call it chasing the work, uh, there's some things that you want to consider. And Brian, you want to, you want to jump in on this one to start and I'll, I'll move to Josh after is um, we talked about this as one of the big things is, is how do you, how do you actually get out there? And one of the, what's the most important thing, that you can think of before you leave? Well, for, for us, we don't respond in, uh, to an area unless we have a client that's requests us to go there. So we really don't chase like some of the other companies do. But <clears throat> we're constantly working with our um, with our MSA clients to understand what, their, what assets they have in the region that could be impacted. Um, and we really re- just focus on responding for them. Then once we're down there, we use those as our anchor projects. And then once we're down there, uh, we let our sales team go out and, and try to chase work from that point. So is that you now when those relationships, if you don't have a relationship, you get a call from like, you're never just putting resources on a truck, rolling a, a fleet down the, the highway and, and getting to a job site without a relationship or without a, a point of contact. Not really. We, we generally either have a relationship with either an MSA client or somebody from our you know, sales team has a strong personal relationship or it's a relationship with a consultant or a um, insurance adjuster. And we'll re- we'll re- we'll, we will mobilize for those types of relationships, but for somebody to you know do a, a, a cold call on us, not really, unless they have really strong um, credit history and, and been in business for a while. We, 
we try to do our due diligence on on new clients so that we understand who we're you know who we're working for. Now, could you define what MSA is for? Uh, um, master service agreement. It's like when you have a national account with uh, a company like Coles or Tractor Supply or Brookdale or Brookfield, one of those. And yeah. then you, you have a master service contract and, and pre-approved rates for certain areas and tasks. And, um, and so really we can get started on with just a purchase order notification from the, um, from the client. Beautiful. Beautiful. Chris, are you guys doing anything different? What's, what's your. Yeah. A lot of times what happens is we we've already been contacted well in advance because people start to get nervous. So obviously blue sky does work with different hospitals and whatnot. And with those relationships, they want to see that you've already mobilized into an area. Now, if you already know the path, which is hard to dial in and say exactly where that thing is going to land and come come in, you have to mobilize to an area that you're not going to be in trouble once that happens. So there's plenty of times that we'll do it unless it's in an area where, again, just like Brian, we don't have an MSA client or someone that's close enough to an MSA that's saying, hey, we need you here. We want to go ahead and put you on on standby or on notice, then we would do it. it. If I go back to my smaller restoration company days though, and kind of hit on a, a point that you made, it's one of those things when, if you make a decision as a company that you want to just head out there with no MSAs, number one, this is a very important topic. What are you taking with you? Are you truly prepared for anything that could come up? And when you get there, one thing that you need to make sure you do, because I don't usually, I'm not an advocate any longer for just rolling out there and seeing what happens. So don't, don't take me wrong. But if you happen to do that, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If you can handle it, you're going to only take on work that you can do and do it really well. Don't just get down there and gobble a bunch of stuff up. That's something that's going to be talked about a little bit later in this, in some of these sessions, but it's extremely important to know in advance, be prepared ahead of time. Don't just go in on a whim. Yeah, Chris. Chris yeah, go ahead. Go ahead say, let me. I would jump into what um, what Chris Elliott said was kind of. Uh, I love the one point as we're going through this is what's cat preparation? Why? Why? Like, why do people want to go do cat work? Uh, I talked to a lot of people that buy franchises um, and or small businesses when I was consulting, and they're like, "Hey, I'm going to go do this cat work because they see uh, companies such as Signal, Blue Sky, Serve Pro, Large Rainbow Offices, whoever it might be." Uh, we're all in this industry, we all have a certain level of ego. And so we like to talk about the big projects we do. Not every project turns out that way and not every cat uh, response turns out that way. And so some people are like, hey, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go chase cat work. Uh, but my question is, does number one, does that fit into your business plan? Uh, when we were preparing for this, I would really appreciate that. What is your business plan? Why, what is the end goal of your business? And if cat work doesn't fit into that, don't get distracted and start chasing cat work just because everybody else is doing it. Uh, one of the things that we need to look at is depending on, on the size the, of our business, uh, when we go out and we start to respond to cat work, what's happening to our home territory? Because there's, I know a number of individuals that they've grown their business because other individuals have left town. Uh, I was born and raised in Metro Detroit. So whether it's Detroit, or Atlanta, Georgia, different places I've lived, people go chase hurricanes and then they don't cover their current clients that they have in the region. And then when they get back after the cat work, they find that they've either lost market share or if they didn't have market share, whatever whatever efforts they were making that were starting to make uh, headway, they might not have seen it. They just completely lost all of that because all the promises they made to those clients, they didn't keep them in their home market while they were also trying to respond to the catastrophe. So there's just a lot of preparation that goes into this versus what, what Chris said of like, Hey, if you're going to load up and just take off, that has worked, but uh, just make sure that you understand that decisions have consequences. And you might get back and have unintended consequences because of a decision we made. Absolutely. We, you know, we have rolled out in, 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 and I'd say Chris, the same thing as you is in our younger days or our smaller days, uh, you're hungry. You're like, oh, I'm going to go make some money. And, and, when you do roll out, we got lucky on a couple. We 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 got burned on a couple others. It is the lottery if you're if you're doing that. And I want to talk about that because it's it's like a lottery versus a planned mindset. And and I know when we mobilized for one of our jobs, um, you know, we rolled out into Calgary. We were we were planning like, what do we have work? No work. Okay, well let's just load up a truck. Let's buy a hundred grand worth of equipment, put it into a trailer, and let's go. 
and and then we hesitated and then by the time we got behind on, on it so we we played the lottery version or like let's buy a ticket and let's try to go let's talk about the planning on the financial side or, or or planning on not the financial side but the the projection side of what makes a a good mobilization effort like when you go and say we're planning to leave we're going to go do this cat we're going to take on 50 jobs like what what metrics are you guys using to to judge whether it's worth responding or not and, and just you know we'll get into a general generalities now or, or you can get down to specifics but um there's got to be a, a like a way that you guys manage or f- calculate whether it's worth going or worth not going and josh i know you just touched on it a little bit but like what's the mindset there because it's it's a planned event or it's a lottery right it's kind of those are the the only two options you have so what, what metrics are you looking to evaluate if you do it open the door to any one of you guys on this one well I, let me i'll jump in what brian said something is hey i i encourage people why why are you going if you don't have a job like an anchor job uh is really the first question i would ask someone like hey I'm, there's a big we look at you know last year was a, a a quieter hurricane season and then the one or two hurricanes we did have like the one that uh hit the panhandle of florida i remember seeing on linkedin everyone and their brother was sister was posting things we're going here we're going here and then it hits like the most least populated area or the least populated area of florida and then it's like to your point chris the lottery ticket all of them were a loser on that lottery ticket so that's my first preparation is does it fit into your business plan and then do you have a job to actually go do because if you don't then you need to understand you're really just putting a bunch of money on the table that you might never recover you know for signal we we mine our msa agreements to make sure that we um know what assets they have in the impacted area and then from there again we it's really kind of a simple task we make sure that we have the equipment to service them um, but then we also reach out to the to not only the upper echelon of, of the MSA account, but we're, to the regionals, uh, the facilities directors at, at the local site, and let them know that we're you know we're we're their contractor, we're capable of handling everything for them, uh, and we, we assure them that they're going to be a priority for us. We because we are we're more of an MSA uh, type contractor rather than chasing. We do honor our MSA agreements and make sure that um, you know people that call us that we have an account with are you know, give them priority. Of course, we do, if we do any government work like hospitals or educational, th- those tend to get jumped to the, to the front of the line or city governments. Um, but, you know, we still make sure that we don't, as, as uh, Chris had mentioned, we don't uh, dilute ourselves so much that we still can't um, uh, service our core client uh, base. Yeah, something from us, just from a different standpoint is once we're committed, we know that we're going to respond to this loss our operations team, we have a national operations team, they come together and they start pre-planning. And this is done sometimes well in advance, sometimes months and months if we know it's gonna be a bad season or we're just trying to get a jump on it, right? So that we're prepared. So this team will come together and say, all right, we have these people within the national team that are able to respond. Let's reach out to the offices and see who we can get. And if that's gonna work for those local offices to see what our bandwidth will actually be, And then we put that into waves. We've got wave one, two, and three, and we know how many people, how many assets, how many trailers, how many different things we're going to be sending in each wave. And then we create basically an internal ROM or rough order of magnitude that says this is how much our spend is going to be the moment we pull the trigger on this and start sending individuals. So that is something that everybody's kind of touched on. Is it in your business plan, business model that you can actually sustain that? Can you spend that money, especially if you don't have a client that you know you're going to get work from or have an MSA that someone's been impacted? Uh, You could lose out on hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight just mobilizing, depending on the size of the crew. So so it's actually interesting because when you're tying in that financials, but you you know, you mentioned it. I know Josh will have the access, his franchise will have access, and we've done it in the past. I was with Paul Davis, and, you know, we had, we didn't have an anchor job necessarily, but we had an anchor franchise or an anchor office. It's like, hey, I'm getting 100 jobs in, and I can only do 25. So you're like, okay, you're now my anchor client. I'm going to get some work from you. And, and it's tougher as an independent because you don't know how other people operate. And even within franchises, the, you know, they'll operate differently. But when when you're starting to look for that anchor job 
maybe it's an anchor relationship. And so like Brian's talking, you got MSA on a smaller level, it's that you know a restorer in the affected area who's overflown, uh, overflowing with work and you're like, hey, I can work with them, uh, come up with a financial agreement, get it in writing before you go. And that's your, now your anchor client to, uh, to go service and you're helping someone with their overflow and it works really good as an independent. But you talk about financials and, and I think this is key. If we didn't have a relationship with our banker, we couldn't have, have cranked up 2016 when we did Fort McMurray. We couldn't have done it without the bank behind us because we had our, we had our plan. We had a lot of time to plan that cat. And then we had our financials lined up. Talk about your burn rates and, and you were talking ROM, Chris. Talk about preparing that and explain that of, of how you guys sort of look at the job and, and we're pulling the trigger. Here's, here's what our cash is going to start going out and, and how we start looking at the incoming cash and timeframes around that. Yeah, absolutely. So with that initial assessment of what's going on, you, you did, I know that we're talking about a job, but the pre-planning before that is you've got to know the cost per person for everything. That means their hourly burn, their per diem, anything else that might actually take place that's going to be needed. Um, any additional materials and supplies and things that you're having to purchase now, anything food wise. I mean, there's all kinds of things you got to think about to come up with that dollar amount. Then once you actually have a job, you need to get on site, make an assessment. And Chris, that's where you're really leaning once you've got a job. Is that right? No, you both. Know. You're talking about pre-planning. I think that's not yeah. enough people do that. So if you're playing lottery, you're only worried about the job. If you're yeah. planning it, you're worried about preparing everything in advance and knowing your burns before you go, your burns yeah. while you're mobilizing, and your burn when you're there. Yeah. And obviously, that's going to differentiate depending on the size of the storm and how many people you're sending. So, um, but when you really get into you know, out of the clouds and start getting into the nitty gritty, as a lot of people say, there's so many things you have to think about as far as preparedness. And I've kind of touched on some of those, but each person's going to need to take food and water with them. That can be a big expense sometimes, depending on how many people are going. Um, some of the things that I've mentioned in some of my notes are communication devices. Do you have something to communicate? Because when you respond, there's plenty of times where you're going to have to drive 25 miles to be able to communicate to someone. That's a problem if you can't talk to your team. So satellite phones, um, three-way radios, whatever you might need, or two-way radios, um, all kinds of different things that you're going to think of in advance. And sometimes it's things that you may not commonly have used, which is the reason it's good to have these kind of conversations up front. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, are you, you guys, when you guys budget, you guys are like you do – larger projects and, and anyone doesn't know signal though well, they're doing some really big stuff but your process isn't much different or or is it are you guys doing something a little bit different because of the way you guys are structured no so we're actually listening to chris talk is just like our leadership team's talking i mean that's that's how we do things is uh we don't get into the detail that that chris is on the um uh, on the the per person burn rate we, we kind of do an overall calculation and at least we have an idea of what our uh, you know, our daily spend is, but what, you know, we, we ramp up for the client, you know, what are, you know, if the client calls us with a hundred thousand um, square foot production facility, we know that, you know, that's going to be three or 400 workers. So we know that our first week's burn rate just for our labor is going to be extraordinarily high on that. So we try to, you know, that's why we do have uh, great relationships with our uh, financial institutions. And, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, we're a privately held company uh, that, you know, we're, Pretty much debt free. So, for us, it's a little bit different. We can we can take on some uh, projects that the ownership group has a, a little bit higher risk you know, appetite for risk than than some of the the mid level um, leaders do. But uh, you know, ultimately, it's it's their company, it's their decision, and and uh, you know, we just try to make sure that we don't get out over our skis too far. Yeah. Well, and then I, I'd go to Chris's point. What's interesting about that is when you're dealing on smaller jobs or smaller work, or you're dealing with mid-sized work, like when you got a hundred million dollar loss, you, you've got a captive client. But to Chris's point, if I'm planning the per person burn, because if I'm going to go talk to a different client and say, Hey, we're going to come over and do a $40,000 job with you. Here's, I need to know those costs down to the person because my, my ability to make the margin is, is much shorter and your errors are going to erode your profits. So I agree on that with both points we've done some big stuff and uh 
and you're a little bit looser because he can be because it's all going to get put into the uh, in, into the agreement anyway. But yeah, that makes total sense. Josh, what, what are you guys dealing with when you guys deal with uh, like like mobilizing as a franchise? Because you got independent owners, so we're dealing with two corporates, and then you guys, which is a is, is a bunch of independent owners. Yeah, so it's interesting you asked that, Chris. We over the past few years, that's one been one of our major objectives or focuses is how do we uh, have better or more coordinated response. Uh, Rainbow has a different background in the industry than uh, some other companies, and so as as we look at this, our owners are like, hey, we want to respond to more catastrophe work, but some of them. Uh, are smaller, so they're not Signal Blue Sky. They're small, ind- uh, small independently owned franchise owners, and so they're looking for leadership from us. And so that's we've built a, a storm plan over the past eighteen months of how, what does the home office do to take the lead? And it's a lot of stuff that Chris and Brian are talking about the same stuff of hey, we're not going to ask a franchise owner to mobilize. That's one of the biggest challenges I think we have is that a lot of our owners are like, hey, I want to go do this. And we're like, no, we know your financials. We know how long you've been in history or uh, in business. We know the history. Let's wait till next year or let's plan for this. But really that that thrill of the chase sometimes can overcome them. And so <laughs> then we then it's a matter of how do we make sure that there's work for them when they get there? And then how do we manage that work? Because uh, everybody, no matter what company we're on the restoration and ecosystem, we're all in this together in terms of we want to raise the level of professionalism of our of the industry we're in. And so how do we manage our reputation and manage the co- the client experience? And so that's what we focused on is that, okay, is there work when we get there or when these owners get there? How do we manage the client experience? And then the most important thing is not just burn rate, but how do you collect on that money? So it's one thing to know, hey, I'm burning X number of dollars, $10,000 a day, uh, $50,000 a day, whatever. But how do we then start to collect on that money? Because I think a lot of people, we all have a servant's heart in our industry, we get it's we're an emergency business. We run out there to help people, uh, but then when it's time for us to say, okay, where's this money coming from? We for many times we forget to set up in the agreement on the front end. Hey, how are we going to get paid? What does this look like? We're going to send you a daily update if it's a commercial job. We're going to send you a daily update and a daily burn rate or our ROM, but we're going to expect to be paid once a week, once a month. Like, how do we set that up? So when we look at this from a franchise level, uh, the franchisor level. We're trying to run this as if we were a large independent, but we have independently owned operated businesses that are coming to support us. And so there's a certain level of uh, authority and influence we have, but then we also have to be uh, aware of joint employer laws and different things where we can give them all the advice, but then they still have to execute on it. So a lot of great advice on this call for people, but it's just, you know, sticking to business basics. Hey, we're going to go do the work. We're going to bill for the work. We're going to collect on the work. And making sure people focus on that. Yeah, one one other thing I would do is is well before you need it, meet with your banker, go for lunch with them on a regular basis, and explain them your business. We we in Fort Mac, we had a line of credit that was about two hundred two hundred twenty five thousand dollars, and at that point in time, we had just taken on some work. Uh, we had hit a slow period. We tied into our line. We were we were in the middle of a slow period. Then we got some work. And we basically chewed up our line of credit and to mobilize you, it's, it's an expensive operation. So we actually went to and met with the bank before we needed it and said, Hey, listen, we've got an anchor job in, in Fort Mac. We're going to need our line extended. Uh, and then we, we went up to three quarters of a million dollars, which is only done if you have a relationship with your bank, only done if you, if you have something where they can trust your history and, you know, we would tell them, hey, we're two into the line. We'd, we'd just tell them at lunch, you know, we're going to be into our line of credit pretty deep this month. And and as long as we were telling them what was happening, hey, we're going to pay it down next month and it gets paid down. All of a sudden, when you come in, you say, hey, we got a big job. We need you there. They stepped up. And so we, we were, were doing that in advance. We didn't have that. We couldn't we couldn't have gone. We would have been cash starved. The business wouldn't have the cash in there. So I, I, I'd really talk about understanding your relationship with your bank or your financial backer uh, and you might have family as a financial backer right you might go to family and say hey we've got to mobilize can i get a quarter million dollars from family and friends and, and we'll go and return that money it's a little bit more risky because uh, you put personal relationships on but the law guys do that and uh, and it's part of playing this game so i really appreciate that guys when you're so we talked about leaving home and getting ready for it uh getting the financials there how about people prep what about the considerations of like your team, right? Um, you have to have the right person that's able to leave and go away for two, four, six, three months, whatever it is. 
Um, you have to have the right mindset. Their family has to be adjusted for it, for mom or dad being away for a while. And then how do we prepare for that person for, you know, potentially cat work when they joined your company and they were planning on coming in and doing cleaning and restoration or, or reconstruction? How are you guys working with people? Is that part of your interview process that you're like, hey, this is what our company does? Obviously, Brian, you guys do it more often. But is that part of the is that part of your hiring process that you're doing that? Or are you looking for a special team? What, what are you guys doing as a strategy for getting people ready for, for cats? So our, uh, we're much like Blue Sky, we have a national operations team. So all, all the national operations guys, they're, you know, they know that that's in their job description to travel and do one-off locations and, and respond to events uh, or to regional events. But you know, like our branch locations, like uh, in in Detroit and in, and in in West uh, in California, we and uh, also New York. Those the 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 employees there, they if they choose to to go to the storm, it's on a volunteer basis and and knowing that their their home market is taken care of. But you know, we're we're big on making sure that the guys. We all know when our storm seasons are, so we make sure that people try to get their vacations in before the meat of the storm season. Uh, you know, we, we do honor vacations when people go out on, you know, on cat, but, but, uh, after the first initial surge, you know, and usually that's three to maybe five weeks, uh, once that initial surge has, has kind of simmered down, we really do put an emphasis on rotating the guys home every couple of weeks. Uh, you know, and we, we have a, a project manager and assistant project manager pretty much on each job. So what that allows us to do is that there's always continuity of leadership on the project. So if, if the project manager is home for his, you know, four days uh, at, at the house, the assistant project manager who's familiar with the, with the project is, is there to, uh, you know, to uh, take his leadership role. Uh, same thing with the APM goes home, you know, the, uh, it, we should not miss a beat on the project leadership just because one of the guys rotate home. But it's, uh, it's, it's key to the success to keep the guys from being burnt out. And then, yeah, after the event, you got to make sure that they have the appropriate amount of downtime what, what you don't want to do is you don't you don't want to wagon train from uh, from one event to the next without you know guys having time to be able to spend you know quality time with their family and 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 reconnect because it is a it's a very strenuous um, time with, you know being away from your family and and you know usually you know every cat that I've been on there's there's always been its own trials and tribulations so you, you got to make sure that you know the guys have the amount of downtime to you know, really decompress from these events. As you yeah, are. Chris, one of the things I think Brian touched on is making sure that they, uh, we think of the team members that are out doing the work or traveling. Another thing is to really, if we, it's to connect the family. Is there something we can do that would help them out when their family members away? Um, whatever it might be, can we send them a meal? Maybe there's, uh, you know, they need the grass mode. Can we get someone to do that? But it's really just understanding that, hey, it's one thing to, for someone to go travel and to deal with that. And all of us that have traveled, we're in the middle of it. You start to develop a routine. But we've, if you have family, you've left uh, a routine behind. And they really feel that, that the change in that. And so how can we make sure that the family understands the, back home that we appreciate them allowing us to have their family member helping to support our business and all those in the impacted area? And one of the things I would say, I know in, uh, Brian, I worked at Signal for a little while before I came back to Rainbow and getting to know Chris, but our company's reputation is going to precede us based on how we handle these different cat events. And the restoration industry, as big as it is, is still a very, very small industry. And so we're going to develop a reputation very quickly as to how we treat our team members. And so if we say, hey, once this is over, we'll give you a week off. And then when they're in the middle of that week off, we start bugging them for a local cat or a local that we really need to be aware of how do we make sure that we honor our word uh, because eventually people are going to say, Hey, this just isn't worth it. If we burn them out. Yeah. I wasn't the best at doing that. I, we would do, uh, we went away for, for, uh, for Fort Mac. When we got home, we got hit with a major water loss and, and we put them back in and that was hard on the teams, right? That's, that's one of those mistakes you make. Just you're focused on the business. I'm not the best at, at focusing at the personal life level. And so, it was, hey, give it, give her, keep giving her. And our team actually turned the uh, tap off and said, hey, we need to take a break. We're not taking any new jobs. It, furious, but it was the right call because the teams needed to realize that we had 
some recovery time in there. And, and uh, you're absolutely right. That's that's key to keeping everyone running for a long time. It's like a marathon, not a sprint. But these are sprint events where you're going to go all out and you're going to need that recovery time. I saw in the chat someone said, you know, two, three weeks and turn them home. It's sometimes tough to do, right? Two, three weeks, you may not even have got your job set up. You have to be prepared for that little longer duration. And then, and then to Brian's point, how do you prevent someone from burning themselves out? And sometimes we have to be better managers at rotating those teams through because people don't want to leave. They'll let the home life fall apart before they, they give up on the job. It's, it's the ego that gets you. And, uh, and it can get you pretty good. On the road, we're talking about resources or, or getting out on the road and managing resources, finding quality labor. How are you guys handling those challenges of, you know, if you're moving from, from one city to a city you haven't done work in or a region you don't do work in, where are you finding those, those relationships, uh, rentals, subs, people, all that? How are you guys handling those situations? So I can go ahead and jump in first. So with, with us working coast to coast and sometimes abroad, we have pre-established relationships, right? So these are contractors um, that have all types of labor source that come in that we use year round, not just when the cat happens. So we, are, we already know a lot of the teams. We know that they can respond anywhere and everywhere, and that's for labor. Now, they are skilled labor. It's not just people... Sometimes uh, people that they just picked up on the side of the road, every once in a while, you'll find someone that's not pulling their weight and you have to, you know, make some changes. But as far as equipment, materials and consumables, you also need to have those pre-established relationships to work with, you know, your a Rams Co's or John Don's of the world or whomever that you use. Um, same with your rental companies. It's not easy on a cat to have rentals just when you need them because everyone starts gobbling that stuff up. So if you can't respond with equipment, that's a whole nother issue to think about, but you need to have those established up front. So that's definitely something to prepare for. Start reaching out now if you haven't done so, because um, most people already have people that they've worked with for five, 10 years and well, well established, so. Yeah, yeah for us, I, it's the same thing. Go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Brian. But for us, it's it's very similar to what Chris has said. But the uh, you know our ownership uh, you know comes from a pretty um, diverse background. So one of the things that we focused on is having uh, having resources in, in a any city that has an NFL franchise. That's probably a large enough market for us to to have our fingers into and 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 develop resources there. So w we try to use that strategy. And then uh, as Chris said, we have national national accounts with providers that we use for labor and you know we can get pretty much any labor that we need um supervision the supervision of the project management are always the toughest um roles for us to fill and you know we always try to fill uh use our our project management teams to, to run jobs but sometimes on smaller jobs we have to we have to put uh somebody else there but then we'll have a stronger um uh, project director that's over him so somebody that has a lot more experience can will be able to we use us as like a force multiplier have that one person control like four or five projects and you know he may have one or two lesser experienced project managers underneath him but you know he has uh, you know direct oversight over them to make sure that um everybody's putting their best foot forward yeah R Rizdowski, i would say what brian and chris have said is that number one is that the time to plan or to have those relationships is now it's not when it happens uh when it happens everybody's already has a million things going on and they're going to say, hey, I'll get back to you after this event is over uh, and would love to talk to you. So when things are calm, whether, you know, you talked about it, uh, even with the banker, like, hey, we're going to go have this discussion with the bank before it happens. And we all know this, is that the time to borrow money from the bank is when you don't need to borrow money from the bank, because when you need to borrow, they don't want to give it to you or they want to give it to you at some crazy rate. But even the same thing with uh, equipment. Uh, what are we going to do for project management? And then Brian touched on a great point is understanding that it might be easier for us to have a temporary labor source or assisted labor come in from different areas, but making sure that we've trained someone to say, hey, your job is to over communicate and take care of this client. Uh, as I mentioned, whether it's at Rainbow, I had the privilege to work at Signal for a while. And um, one of the things I learned from uh, from Frank Torrey, who's one of the owners there, is that over communicate. Like Frank has a saying, I don't want to steal it, but it's relentless customer service. 
And so it was like, hey, this one person is going to over communicate with the client. And if they have to take seven or eight temporary workers and make sure that they're doing all the, the actual work, then that's something to uh, to make sure we train on. Because when we bring someone up out of uh, the field, let's say, as they're advancing through their career, a lot of times that's a very hard transition to go from doing the work to managing the work because the mindset hey, is, if I'm not working, people are going to think that I'm not pulling my pulling my fair share of the work when really nothing could be further from the truth. So right now, uh, is there ways or are there ways that we can start to cross train people uh, and make sure that they understand what leadership and communication look like before we put them into an environment where uh, that leadership and communication is going to really need to be, uh, they're going to have to show out very well and they're going to be living in very challenging conditions. So if they're, if it's a mobilized cat versus a local cat, they're already going to be dealing with, Hey, I'm not living in my same routine. Maybe I'm not seeing my family. Uh, we want to make sure we've trained them on communication and leadership and what it looks like to manage others before that happens. No, it makes complete sense. And and I think when you look at it, those relationships, the bank, you know, your, your rental companies, your resource companies, you know, are you bringing in consumables and how much, how many weeks of consumables do you have with you? I know we, you know, we responded out to uh, uh, a couple of cats out, out in Northern uh, BC. How many, how many, uh, uh, weeks of supplies do you have for your teams and are you going to be burning it up and, and what's the chance we're going to have to run trucks up with another haul of supplies and where are we getting it from all that is is key and we talk about this because it's increasing your costs so you have all these relationships now you have increased costs that don't necessarily get put into business as usual um chris can you jump into a little bit of that because we were talking about this once before where you you it's easy to say, hey, we're going to respond to the cat. We know how we run our jobs at home. But there, there's a whole cost scheme around responding to cats. And, and and it's not easy to understand until you get hit with the bills and you realize you didn't make any money. I think this is probably one of the hidden dangers of mobilizing when you just don't know what those other costs are. Can we get into that? And, Brian, I know you're, you've got a piece of that. And, Josh, like I just, but Chris, if you wouldn't mind starting us off things to consider, things that you should prepare for, and the cost that go with it, maybe. Yeah, and that's, um, to, to better make sure I understand your question, that's anytime we're mobilizing, we're getting out there, because we've, we've touched on a lot of it, but I want to make sure I really uh, zone in. So you're talking right there, increased costs. So there's something that I wrote down as one of the notes, and there's a few unique things that you do need to think about. If you're going to respond to a job and you've already come up with your wave one, wave two, this is what it's going to cost to get out to the cat. There's going to be, all right, we're sending one full trailer that can encompass a very large $1.2 million job, whatever it might be, for a good week and a half, two weeks. That's all established. But there's other things that you may need to think about, such as DOT regulations, OSHA regulations, other little things that could come up. Are you prepared to handle those things? Um, because I can tell you, if you get to a loss and you're you're already jumping on it, but you haven't considered local rules and regulations, OSHA rules and regulations, there's going to be a lot of extra costs that could hit you, especially if something's wrong. Um, another thing as far as a prep item, when we've sent people into the field, they're loading up their own, you know, company provided vehicles, usually larger pickup trucks, the, the 2500s, the 250s, loaded down with material supplies, monitors, so that they can set up a mobile command center, whatever it might be. Some of the little things to think about, are you taking fuel with you, right? So sometimes you're going to get into a CAT event. You may be able to get gas just before you get to the worst hit part. Then you're going to get on in there. Nothing works. That's why we mentioned cell service. Cell service is down. There's no power. Gas stations don't work. There's nowhere to get food. So all of those pre-planning items, have you thought through it? Do you know what that additional cost is going to be? And um, those are really some of the, the main things. The last point, and it seems kind of trivial sometimes, but if you are personally responding, do you have a couple extra spare tires for your vehicles, for your generators you're pulling behind your equipment, for your trailers? you will 
you will have multiple flat tires that you can't get around it. It's going to happen. So those are the little expenses. Yeah, it's, it's not that much additional cost, but by the time you've got a spare tire or two for each item, it, it really starts to stack up and add up. Um, once we uh, get through to the other guys, I do need to go back to something that you said, Chris, and touch on that. So once these guys go, I'll... No, no. Perfect. And yeah, Brian, do you us, have, yeah, let's pass it over to you. Well, so Chris brings up the 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 best point. I mean, I've been on deployments where we've changed more tires than a NASCAR pit crew. So <laughs> he, he's he's speaking the truth there. The, right. You know, for us, the increased cost. You know, as as Chris mentioned, you know the the obvious things, but you know, there's there's other things that you you know, are you going to fly? You know, like like when we responded to Puerto Rico. You know, you have to have equipment right away. So it's it, we flew it there, but we put it on a barge to come home. So, you know, we had to have the emergence there, the expediency of the, you know, using a uh, aircraft to get it there. But the exigent circumstances are over at the post storm, so you don't have to, uh, you know, incur the same cost. Instead of spending five hundred thousand dollars to get equipment there, you can put it on a barge and let it get home in two and a half weeks. When you know, when you don't have the uh, emergency behind it. But, you know, think about your carrying cost, uh, you know, f uh, with your bank, you know, what, what's the, the, what are your costs to, to tap that line of credit that you have? And, you know, with that, you have to bear in mind that, you know, on most of these jobs, there's going to be cons building consultants on them. So you are going to take a little bit of margin hit on, on, on some of those projects and, you know, Right, wrong, or indifferent, they have a they have a very critical role in in, in the performance of our work. And if it's uh, you know if you have an adversarial relationship with them, it, it can really slow down the payment um, the the you know time for you to get your your bills collected. So which impacts your cash flow. So those are all things that you gotta have to kind of take into account when you're really looking at you know what's what's more what's my ROI going to be for this event. You know if if I know if I know going in that I'm targeting, you know, 45% margins, but I know that my carrying costs are 7% for, to use my line of credit. And I know that I'm going to lose four or 5% automatically, you know, with the building consultant there. So that's the margin erosion that you already kind of have to account for. So you, you, all those things have to be in the back of your mind when you're making these decisions. Yeah, that's huge. And I, and I think that the, the word's right erosion, because it's, it's things that you're you're sort of aware of, but it's as as time goes on, as your payments delayed, that's just cutting into your profits that you didn't plan for. It's just eroding into it as as you get those things. I like that term. Yeah, Chris. One of the things that Brian just touched on, and this is what you know, Brian has a, a great reputation in the industry as being a phenomenal estimator. But there's another area of, I would say, is how are you going to write your estimates. Um, is something they consider no matter who you are, whether we're this is the first time we're responding to a cat, we're a, a developing company, we'd say an emerging company, or we're a very established company. But how are you writing the estimate? How are you documenting all that? So, number one, let's talk about that. Like, how are we documenting everything? And then maintaining that documentation because inevitably a building consultant or a third party consultant is going to show up on the job. And if you don't have documentation, that's going to create um, margin erosion, both in Things that they might say, hey, you, we can tell you did it, but you don't have documentation. Therefore, we're going to have a discussion around it and or you're going to have margin erosion because you're spending more time discussing it than you should if you had good documentation. But one of the things is, is the it's interesting if you ever want to do an, uh, an exercise in your business is start to review every estimate that your company writes, put two sets of eyes on it. And watch how much you miss because you're so involved in what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and someone else picks up on items that you should be charging for. So if you don't have a good estimating system or job flow within your company, to Brian's point, if you know that you're going to start um, paying to borrow money and you're going to have a third-party consultant and then you're writing, let's say, a bad estimate or a less than stellar estimate, that's another area where... Um, I've seen anywhere from four to as high as 16 or 17 percent that people find on their estimates when they have a second set of eyes review it. So going into all of this, understand what it looks like to write a good estimate off of good documentation, um, because that's one way area where we can already set ourselves apart financially of making sure we capture all the dollars that we're entitled to. Oh, 100 percent. No, it's and, and it's. 
it's using that. Now, here's a question just on the estimate. I know we get into it a little further, but, um, you know, when you're looking at writing an estimate, like an Xactimate versus TNM, uh, is there a preferred mo model that you guys use? I know, Brian, you, you use both, but is there is there a time when you're going to say, you know what, it's just TNM on everything and and prefer to stay away from the unit pricing and or, or do you do you roll over to units on a regular basis? So we mitigation is usually generally uh, is always time and material for us, uh, just based on our MSA, and then uh, and then also you know you kind of have some uh, you know the sense of urgency is a little bit different in these cats. You know you have to get a business up and running. You know the, the old motto the motto of uh, you know our job is to put you back in business fast. I mean that's that really holds true here. So Xactimate falls short on some of those uh, parameters. So we prefer time and material on, on the mitigation. Uh, but, and then on construction, there are times that we'll do time and material. And there's, there's also times that we will do, um, you know, ex Xactimate. It really depends on the, if it's a straightforward project, you know, by all means, we can do Xactimate. If it's in a high rise in downtown New York City on a 40 story building, uh, you know, Xactimate is not maybe the best tool for there. You can help certainly help set the scope and, and manage from that. Uh, but, you know, ultimately you're going to fall uh, significantly short of, you know, your anticipated margin goals. If you're, if you're using Xactimate there, I mean, we, we have one right now where uh, it's, you know, in, in Xactimate in, in Manhattan. And um, it's one of those, we're either going to make a lot of money or we're going to hardly make anything. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it just depends on how well, how effectively we can manage the project. Yeah, no, and and, and that's that seems to be the trend. Is uh, and I think you know if you're if you haven't done a lot of cats, you're tempted to jump into Xactimate because that's what you use at home, that's what your your vendor programs use, or or that's how you you build your business. Uh, I think the most successful companies doing cat work are doing T and M because you just can't uh, change for the inefficiencies of that environment and you're going to be guessing at it whereas you know time material rate and material whatever you want to call it is a better model because you're dealing with those inefficiencies that we normally encounter in in, in a cat type of environment so it's really good yeah i want to jump in on that one because it is extremely important we're the same way that brian mentioned but something that you really have to do is have the schedule of fees or rate sheet set up in advance and if you're getting that to the client, there's really no punches to be pulled. They can see everything. This is what each person costs, each item costs. We are good to go. Sign, don't just sign our work authorization. Sign our schedule of fees that we gave this to you and turn that back in. They can't say that they didn't know up front what it was going to cost, depending on how severe the job was, how long it takes, et cetera. Um, one thing I want to jump back real fast, Chris, is you made a comment um, that someone texted me on just to kind of get clarification that within, you know, when do we send our people home to get a, a break or whatnot? And you said two to three weeks to set up your job. Um, and they question that it's not to set up that one particular job, so to speak. Um, you can expound on that. But with the way I interpret that is when you get into a cat event, you're not going to yeah, you'll have your job set up where it's drying, your equipment's going, you got your documentation, your people are in line, but you may have two, three, four, 15 jobs. You're trying to get them all managed and which one's the priority and how do you do it? Sometimes all of that process, we usually tell people you're there a minimum one month. Nobody's getting a break. We're working seven days a week. We'll do the best we can to get people breaks when we can, but that's usually how long it takes depending on how what the severity of those losses are or how bad the cat event is before we can dictate when people start to turn off and go home. So that's, that's how I interpreted what your comment was. Yeah, no. And, and it's, it, it is that it's, you know, two to three weeks, you've got the pre pre prep. So if you look at it as preparing for it, you're gearing up your trailers, you're servicing them, getting the bearings done, getting the tires checked, putting extras on, on trailers. And then you get into the, the cat where you mobilize your, your, your transported out there, you're setting up jobs, you're building your, your headquarters, Maybe you're set up in a parking lot and you're fencing it off, whatever you're doing to get set and you're working the job, two weeks flies by really fast. Three weeks flies by really fast. And then you're, you know, the way I look at it with our team is that, hey, we're there, we're trying to do a four to six week run. Um, and occasionally, you know, we were flying people home. So who's responsible for those costs of rotating employees out? So you have to either, you know, is that part of the agreement on a job? Are you building into your hourly rates? 
Uh, is it part of per diem where you just, you know, if you're working six days and they get a seventh day off uh, by law, well, then if they're taking that seventh day off, we have to put that seventh day of accommodations and per diem and any wages you owe into the other six. So you have to start planning your financials out that way. But, uh, you know, just in my mind, it's a little bit bigger commitment that you have to be there for a time. I, I agree with you. About a month is where we went. And then it's like, now we can, st now we're set up. The, the high intensity is dropped. Now we can start getting people home and rotate them in and out, but it's really hard to do uh, if you're trying to win at cats. Like it's, it's, you got to commit to it and your team has to commit. Yeah. But yeah, I would agree with you on that. That's what, and that was the point I was trying to make is right, right, two, right. three weeks is pretty light. And to, if you want to maximize your margin, you're better off to push the team a little harder for a little longer. And then maybe you, you wrap up quicker. Right, so maybe you're there for eight weeks, and where you could have been there for for twelve weeks, be like, hey guys, let's go hard for eight, and then we'll come home, and then you take two weeks off, and and we'll slow the shop down. But to Josh's point, and and this is where I got stuck in it. I have local resources or local relationships that we need to then service. We come home and we want to give you downtime, but now our local relationships are going to suffer in that market. So we decided to push through until the team said, Hey, we, we need the break. And, and that's not the best way to lead, but that's how we pushed them hard. Right. We were going hard for the wins and, uh, and, and then hopefully give people a break. We, we just didn't get a break. It just kept coming. So. Yeah. One last piece I'll mention on a uh, additional cost and things. Sometimes you have to consider depending on the labor source you're working with, you may have to help them with certain items. They can't get hotel rooms that are close enough because of, whatever contacts or cash flow issues, you may have to front them on that. That's additional costs coming out of your pocket. And it's a lot of money. If you've got hundreds of people coming in, um, it, you may need to consider food items, water items, all that kind of stuff. Usually the, the job site will carry enough water for all the employees. You have to do that right. But outside of that, you need to make sure you're taking care of all the people within certain realms because you can't just take care of everything for everybody. But uh, just be cautious of that because it adds up very quickly. Let's talk about that because because I mentioned you know we got we went to a cat and then we came home to a, a stay at home cat. Let's jump into that because those are a little bit different. You, you get the comforts of home. You're not necessarily you know if you ever played sports and you go on the road when you're away from family, it's a different environment than when you're when you're at home and you have all the distractions of home and you're trying to accomplish the same goals. It, it it's a different environment playing cats at home. But when they hit your hometown. Uh, you have to be prepared in some ways they are similar to being prepared on the road, but you're dealing with different challenges. Chris, you guys have dealt with, with that. And uh, what, what would you say one of the bigger challenges is of, of the home game or, or just, you know, just describe the difference there? Sure, absolutely. I think for me, just personally going through it a couple of times, it's a lot different. I would much rather have to respond to some devastated area than have to do it at home because the, the family piece is so much harder because you're having to work the really late hours. You're having to do all these things and then you still have to go home and it makes it extremely difficult because you're not only doing all the cat stuff, the only spare time you have, you are doing all those extra things that you might've paid someone to do. You, maybe that's something you consider. You pay someone to still cut the grass and all that, but there's going to be other things that you still have to take care of. You have very little or limited downtime at, at that point because there's just so many additional things you really are responsible for. So to me, that's one of the biggest things. Um, other than that, the other biggest thing for me is when it is local, the local office people don't necessarily have that same mindset of I'm responding to a loss. And sometimes they may be withdrawn saying, I can't do this. This is too much for me. I still need my, I need to work my 60 hours a week and all this other stuff. Now, granted, not many people say that because they're usually paid pretty well in our industry. But you do have to consider that not everyone signs up for cat duty home or abroad. And you have to be willing to say, all right, we have to work with these folks and, and come to some kind of happy medium because they will burn out very quickly if they're like, this is not for me. Yeah. Now you also yeah. run, you run, you run into the burnout, you run into the distractions. Um, if you take a, a, a cat at home, you also have, you still have the same cash flow concerns, right? You're putting out a ton of dollars. Um, you, maybe you're helping out your sub trades or the sub trades jump in to help you. So it's easier to get manpower because you have relationships in town. You can draw on that. But 
but that cash position is still a major risk that you could run out of cash if adjusters aren't writing you checks fast enough. And I don't think, I think that's the difference. When you go on the road, you know that cash is, you're, you're, you're thinking about it. But when you're at home, you're like, no, this is our home business as usual, just busy. And you can get lost in that. And if you're not, you know, when you're a smaller player, when you're, you're not corporate, uh, your line of credit can get chewed up pretty quick and those funds take forever to come in. What, what, Josh, what do you guys, what do you guys look at when you, like, you know, you've gone through this and you guys are, are talking to a bunch of franchises, smaller operators that are sometimes maybe running against compressed financials or, you know, you just run against a, I don't know if you'd say compressed financials, but when it hits at home and you're not expecting it and it's, di- it's a different way of, of mindsetting the, uh, the attack on, on a local cat, no? Well, it's a different mindset, but I think Chris Elliott hit it right on the head is, you know, I've learned, I think all of us would say is the lessons we've learned are because we've made these mistakes and we're like, okay, I'm never going to do that again. Uh, and I think a local cat in some ways you can burn people out quicker because you are going home to sleep in your own bed and you have like all of the resources close by or something. And so I've made these mistakes of, Hey, we're going to, you know, back in Metro Detroit, the floods uh, of 2014, uh, you know, is we had more files than we could get to in weeks. And so it's like, oh, we're just going to keep working. And to Chris Elliott's point, I mean, I had a lot of uh, water mitigation specialists making more money than me, the vice president of sales, everyone, which is good for them. Uh, They loved it. But what I learned was, is that after somebody works 12 to 14, 15 hours a day, the return on investment drastically drops off uh, in terms of what they're producing. Uh, You also run into safety hazards where they're behind the wheel of a vehicle, they're not making the best decisions. And so we learned like, hey, we're going to break this up into shifts. Like if they want to work up to a certain number of hours a day, we would have let we let them. But then we also started telling the clients, hey, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have group A come out to do uh, extraction and group B is going to do all of the demolition and group C is going to come in. And uh, in the case of like that cat three losses, they're going to come in, uh, pressure wash, apply a biocide, whatever it is. We started to break it up, but then we were much more focused on um, you know, if you come in at seven, you can work till seven or eight or nine at night. Uh, there was the initial shock of the first three to five days we were working all kinds of hours. But then when we settled into this routine, it's like, okay, after nine or 10 PM, most homeowners and neighborhoods don't even want you there. Uh, so why don't we break this up? Uh, but then that leads into the financial part, Chris, really what we learned is, uh, one of the key performance indicators that you can study as a company uh, we've got one of our franchises out on Long Island, New York. One of his key performance indicators, and I got this from him, is from the time you get a certificate of completion signed, how fast do you build that job out? He's got that up on a board in his office for all of his staff. And so in a cat, I think that's something we should really monitor is from the time this thing is done and we get the sign off, how fast do we bill it out? And then who's calling regularly on where that money is at? Because that's if we don't build a job out, we can't get paid. And so when you talk about this cash flow crunch, there's a lot of times that we like to complain in the industry about the insurance adjusters or TPAs or other people. Uh, but I think we're just as much to blame at certain times if we don't look in the mirror and say, hey, I really want Brian, the adjuster, to pay me. And I'll pick on Brian. Oh, wait, I haven't I haven't billed Brian. So how's he even supposed to pay me? Uh, we don't do a good job of that. One thing I wanted to circle back on, Chris, Uh, Chris Elliott mentioned it is sometimes, whether it's a local cat or a national cat we've traveled for, when we're going to help out different people, he said, hey, well, sometimes we might have to get hotel rooms and front the money for them, or we might have to do different things. Understand that when we start to front money for other subcontractors or other individuals, there should be a value to that, that we're charging them. I think that's one of the things I learned when I worked in Augusta, Georgia, is that, you know, money has, you know, borrowing money, the time value of money. So if a subcontractor comes to me and says, hey, I need to be paid in 14 days versus 30. If I have the money in the bank and I can do it, that's not not a problem. But what's that worth? There should be a percentage of us paying them quicker because now we've assumed all the risk that we're going to get paid uh, if that job hasn't been paid or we don't have a draw. And so I think that's something to keep in mind is that we need to write that out. If there's a a prompt pay discount, put that on uh, on their invoice, you know, net 14 comma 12% 12% or whatever it is, or 3% or whatever our prompt pay discount is, uh, that's another way that our margins get compressed. But how do we, if we're going to help other people out by using our cash because we're a financially responsible company, 
or we're a more mature company like Signal or Blue Sky or larger Rainbow Owners or whoever it is, there's a value to that. And so we want to be reasonable in what we charge people. Uh, but if we're willing to pay them quicker, uh, now we're acting as the bank and we should be compensated as such. Oh, it's, it's 100%. And it's not even like the bank is, is this money is valuable to us. Uh, would you rather have your sub trade who's doing a rebuild or, or a plumbing job? You know, if you put a thousand dollars there, or you put a thousand dollars into water damage, you, you could get a six time return on water damage. So you're absolutely right. There, there is a part of it is you got to fund that 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 sub trade and keep them running. So it's your responsibility if you want to have that resource. But there is a big value to cash when it's limited or or it's under pressure, right? And you got that that flow coming out of the cat that's putting that pressure on the cash flow. Cash is well, the biggest. That- you had if you had a million dollars and you're trying to do two hundred thousand dollars of work, you could do it all day long. But if you're trying to do a million dollars and you got two hundred thousand cash, you got to work it hard. The other thing I'd say, Chris, is it's always good when you when you pay your subcontractors promptly and you pay them better than other companies. It's always awesome when you call them and they drop everything to come to your job. That's another thing to keep in mind. Is we talk about, hey, I want to get this work done. Uh, and a lot of times we call our subs and we're like, I'm super busy, I'm super busy. But if they know that, hey, when I work with Chris Elliott, he pays me as he says he will, and I get paid on a regular cycle, they're going to run over there and and work for him faster than if they, hey, every time I work for Josh Miller, I've got to call him seven times to get my money. There's a value to that, which then translates to our business development departments being able to go back and say, hey, Brian Newell brought this up. When we call people and we set up these MSAs, when we know we can deliver, then it makes our uh, business development department look even better. Yeah. Now, in here, when you start looking at, so so you go from that perspective, and then you're looking at, you know, we, we talk about, well, there's burnout, faster burnout at home because there's more distractions and, and you've got life hitting them from all sides. Um, but when you're dealing with contracts, well, I guess this would be home or away, is is what are you doing with customers that fall short on insurance or they don't know if they have insurance the adjuster hasn't come by are you guys running cash on the barrel uh you know pay us 100 percent up front 50 percent up front are you doing much of that i mean if it's a local cat and let's say it's not complete devastation right because if it's complete devastation it's a whole different ball game um, but if it's something where there's been some flooding in basements and whatnot, something that we have always done is we want half up front, especially if insurance is not involved. If you can't pay half of a, I don't know, $5,000 bill, you're probably not going to be able to front the rest of that money. And so that gives you enough leverage to get in, triage the situation, and then you can assess it based upon the interactions with the customer and whatnot. Um, and that's on your smaller stuff, residential type things. If it's a larger company, we're talking a whole different conversation. Yeah, that makes sense. We we had uh, we used to do fifty percent to get you on the schedule, and fifty percent when we show up. And if it was a cash deal, uh, because it was just too valuable. Like we we looked at scheduling time as very valuable, and we didn't do a ton of them. But if you were coming in with cash, then it was fifty percent to get on the schedule, and fifty percent when we roll in. And and then you sign the completion certificate. And we'll give you a warranty or whatever follows on the back. But I'm I'm not. People love to call you. They love the the commitment. And then once the work's done, it's really hard to collect. I, I don't like the administrative pressures that that puts on the company when you have to chase cash. Brian, you guys don't deal with that much. But but Josh, in your past, you probably have. Brian, you've done that actually. Probably you've been chasing cash deals on on the big side though. Yes, and it's uh, so we focus on our contracts. Um, you know, we have our base contract, but if, if we're working for a client in Florida, uh, everything is tailored towards the local language. So we hire local counsel to fine tune our contracts to make sure that we have the lien language correctly, or if there's if there isn't lien rights there, or, um, you know, we just everything is tailored to them. Dispute resolution, everything is tailored to the local market. That way, um, we know going in that you know. Our, our contracts are, are pretty robust. So we've had, we've had great success collecting um, the vast majority of our, of our outstanding invoices, but it's, it's all been based on our contract and our billing practices. You know, we, we bill accurately and we bill timely. Um, and to Josh's point, you know, from on a time of material project, if it's anything of any size, you know, we're billing every couple of weeks uh, at the, at the least we're billing is monthly. And on, 
on Xactimate things on on larger projects like that. We we do interim building. We do a you know twenty five percent initial draw, and then we have you know milestones at the fifty percent uh, completion, seventy five percent completion, ninety percent, and then we allow the last ten percent to be a holdback based on their recoverable depreciation and things like that. That makes sense. Our, our success all revolves around the contract. Yep. Yeah, that's the rules of engagement, and you can take that to court and and defend it and win. Um, we're we're gonna run for about ten more minutes, and then we're gonna take a break, guys. I I, I know we usually run these things straight through. Uh, we'll take a break here in about ten minutes. I, I want to talk a little bit about documenting and and triaging your cats, getting things prepared, understanding what you're walking into, and then making sure your documentation. I think it was Brian or. Or Chris has said, hey, like documentation this, or it might have been Josh, one of you guys, it was one of you guys that said it, is, is documentation is key. And, and I think, you know, when you're talking about that communication, over communicating, documenting, that strategy has to be planned from from the start. And I, and I know we focus on it as a circle, but that's our, that's our core business. But for you guys in the field that are actually doing it, Brian, you used us in Puerto Rico. Uh, I got to, to view one of Brian's files when I first it was near when I first started with Encircle and, uh, and he was doing some big work down there and we did some, uh, some discussing of how he was handling. But the, the, the part that impressed me was Brian was ultra focused on the customer communication. And so it was easy to talk to him about what he was doing, but can you guys get into that? The documentation, like you're dealing with big dollars on, on big jobs or, or, or high volume jobs. Talk about your documentation practices, what's important, where you've won, where you've lost. So for us, our documentation process is the same on a on a hundred thousand dollar job as it is on a hundred million dollar job. You know, if it's not documented, it didn't happen in in the claims team's eyes. So you really have to make sure, you know, whether you're using Encircle or Company Cam or anything like that for your for your for your daily communication on the on the project. We we call them daily field reports, but uh, a daily field report is done at the end of every pro, at the end of every day. And distributed to the stakeholders as identified by the ownership group. Sometimes they want us to include the claims team and the consulting team. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they want it as an internal document. So, you know, the very first thing that we focus on with our, uh, you know, when we meet with the client is what their priorities are. Um, and so that, you know, if, if they tell us up front that they want to share seamlessly with the claims team, then by all means, we give them access to all of our all of our paperwork and and our documentation process. But we try to do the same thing over and over and over so that when a project manager goes from a $100,000 job, he uses those same principles to document his $100 million job. And it, and it just becomes, uh, it becomes about systems and processes. And, and the more your systems and processes are, you hit the button and the ac activity happens, the better off that you're gonna, that, that you're gonna be. Because you know, these $100 million project is just a series of, of $100,000 projects which are, can be broken down further to a group of $10,000 projects. It's the same, you know, it's the same uh, practices that, that will see you through to the end and to, to make it a successful project. Yeah, it's probably actually one of the misnomers is that the large $100 million jobs, you're going to change your process up and, and put it into a different workflow. It's like, no, it's just, it's just amplified multiple times and you're just going to keep repeating that step. So it, no, that's awesome. Hey, Chris, one of the things you just said, and it ties with what Brian was saying about workflow, um, I think one of the things that, that we need to consider as a company or as an industry, but individual companies need to make this determination. I know there's a lot of people out there now that they'll call in like a registered third-party evaluator or someone. We have like TPA, we have third-party consultants. Now they're calling in experts as well to say, hey, uh, let's call people in to, to test for soot, char, and ash or what, categorize the water. Because now we have like this high level uh, expert on the job site that goes in there and uh, they have a very scientific view of they're going to say, hey, these are the impacted areas. This is an area that needs to be addressed. It helps to, to create what we're going to do, our workflow or our job flow. And then we get into our documentation practices. But it's part of the workflow is when we get a certain type of job, what is our company going to do or how do we handle this? Uh, so that later on, because in a cat, let's say that it's a, a read or a, a national cat or a hurricane, there are times that that building consultant is not going to show up till uh, days, weeks, maybe a month later. 
So all this documentation is important, but having this documentation and all of these different testing methods and really good photos are going to help us with all of our documentation as to whether or not we followed or how we followed the S500, the S520, different industry standards. Hopefully soon the S700 coming out, but a lot of different information that I think, or a lot of different ways we can handle this, but it's something to consider is when do we need to, or do we do it on every job, but how do we call someone in to say they're going to test for it? Then it's not Josh Miller's opinion that this is category one, category two, category three. We have a registered expert that's taking care of this uh, so that they can move forward uh, in explaining why that determination was made. And then there all we say is, hey, this was the category and now we follow industry best practices. No, that's a good point because it is something that we're seeing more and more. We're seeing, you know, consultants show up with a three-day water course and and trying to tell guys how to dry and they've never dried a building and and questioning and be like, well, I read the standard, it says this, but you didn't understand the standard. And I think you see that on, as you get into that, that scale and then you get the other side of the building consultant where you've got a seasoned pro on the other side and 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 they're reviewing the file from a technical aspect going, that's a good decision based on the information you had at the time. I would have agreed with your decision. So that makes sense why we got the cost that went this way. But you have to review those files in, in a, a certain metric. But it's interesting. So when you're when you're looking at that documentation, you're doing daily reports, Brian. You're talking about doing the daily field reports. Um, Every day, you're, I, like, I know you guys were generating massive, massive reports. I think you ran, what did you say, 1.2 million photos in our system? And, and at the time, we charged you 10 bucks, so you, you, you got a deal. Uh, <laughs> um, but we, we, were, we, were, we were doing, he was doing some amazing stuff, but the amount of volume on that, the amount of visual evidence. And then you're also using other systems. Like, what else do you guys use? You, if you're using Circle, great. Uh, but what else do you use to, to document the field? So for us, we, you know, we really rely heavily on the client communication and the, the stakeholder communication through and circle just because of the functionality and it, it gives a, a nice product. Um, but we also use, you know, 3D scan technology, you know, like Matterport or uh, uh, DocuSketch. Uh, we've really embraced the drones for exterior inspections. Uh, you know, we've used company cams uh, for, you know, for some projects when, like if you're in an industrial um, industrial setting, you know they may not be used to work looking at uh, in circles, so they're more familiar with a, a product like Company Cam or Fieldwire. Like in, in Puerto Rico, when we were doing the, the major construction side there, the owner's rep was he loved in circle for the reporting, but he didn't like the functionality to be able to go in and as a project management tool. So we we're using a product called Fieldwire that allowed you know all the stakeholders to participate in scheduling. Uh, you know, making comments on, you know, a documentation process and things like that. So for, you know, for certain products, we, or for certain projects, we can use, um, you know, we will go outside the InCircle family, but for our day-to-day -day core work, you know, we really rely heavily on, on 3D scanning and, and then also the InCircle suite of products. Nice. Are you guys, are you guys doing, so, so when you talk about products, you're, you're, you've got contracts, you're doing your photos and 3D scanning. Um, what do you have for like sign off? Like part of that pro documentation process or, you know, your flow is, you know, when are you doing sign offs, change orders and, and things like that? Like, how are you managing, how are you managing the flow? Like, you know, when you come up with a problem that you didn't anticipate, how are you, how are you documenting and communicating that? Well, it really, everything is documented through the DFR. Um, so, if, so if we have a change DFR of scope, us. I'm sorry. I'm define the DFR. The, the daily field report, every, all of our communication really flows through that. And so if an adjuster or the consultant wants to change a scope or say the business owner has a change in priority, you know, he needs to get a certain lineup faster to meet production goals, then, then we'll switch. We'll identify on the daily field report. Hey, uh, you know, the adjuster wants to focus on because of business interruption, we're going to focus on on this area first, so that that gets uh, put out in the DFR, and then we'll go to our ROM calculation. If if it doesn't change our ROM, then we really don't do, uh, you know, we don't do a, a change order or a, a scope change. If there is going to be a significant impact to the ROM, uh, or you know, any of our budget productions or burn rates, then we'll we'll do a, a scope change letter 
and and give a additional ROM calculation. Or if we're doing a hard dollar number and it's through Xactimate, then then we'll do a Excel spreadsheet, you know, format that we that we've created for a change order. That's a real simple document, but we but we track all of that. Um, so any any document that we create, there's a master document so that so that we know that there's a log. So there may be 14 change orders um, through the course of a two-year project, but I can just pull up the spreadsheet and look at, okay, change order one was this, there was this much value, this, who approved it on what date, change order two, on down the road, change order three was not approved and and who, you know, we document who did not approve it and why. Um, so all those, you know, documentation is the key to you uh, recouping uh, significant portions of your invoice. So for us, they, they all go hand in hand. It all it helps us control the narrative and helps us allow us to tell the story as 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 we see it. And um, you know, sometimes that's not at odds, or sometimes that's at odds with what how the insurance company sees it. But you know, the, the facts remain the same. If if you don't have it and and present it to the client, they don't know that there's an issue going on. Yeah. Hey, Brian, we had a question about what is ROM, and, and I wanted to explain rough order of magnitude is. You might have heard it in the past. It might have been called like do not exceed, but I hate the term do not exceed because it, it's that's a, a false pretense that we're not going to go past that number. But a rough order magnitude is, is what you're looking at for the total loss of the job. So uh, in Brian's case, he's like, hey, it's, it's, it's a $100 million job. In my case, it's, it's going to be like $10,000 job. What you can do is you can use a ROM range. So if you get to a job early and you kind of are ballparking it as – from what I found is we're not very good at, at picking the, the the actual cost. The high end is usually, we usually come in higher than what we think it's going to be. So wherever you're sitting on your ROM, if you think it's 10,000, you could come in and say, hey, it's about 8,500 or, or 8,000 to about $15,000. I'm, I'm giving you a rough order of magnitude range. Once you get into the job and you figure things out, you can narrow that range down as you go. And, uh, and, and I think it's key that, yeah, do not exceed was set a hard a standard or an expectation. You're gonna hit a hard number, you're not gonna go past that. But as things change on the site, you find complexities or complications that uh, are adding cost to your job, you, you could easily go through that number. And so that's why I think you gotta use the rough order of magnitude as your terminology or your, your nomenclature. Uh, any of you guys see anything different there? Are you using do not exceeds? I, I got away from it years ago. Um, but are you are you guys you using ROMs? Yeah, rare, rarely do we do a not not to exceed, and and then we'll only do it when it's a really highly defined, clearly robust, um, detailed scope of work. Um, that way, you can track everything based on the scope. So if if they're saying, hey, you're you know, clean this one production area, I can track the manpower and tell you, okay, this was not the light cleaning like the scope said. It was more of a, a heavy cleaning and and here's why we had a you know 20 percent increase in labor costs so you know that's that's the only time that we that we'll do those that we really try to avoid them um, as much as possible hey brian uh, to, to your point there you just you just hit on it but i think it's a critical point when we get into cats people loosen up their scope and they say hey you know i'm i'm gonna go in and we're gonna wipe the uh uh, the contaminants off walls, but they don't get into the actual scope. And, and you're still talking about make sure it's detailed because when it changes, you're going to be able to articulate the price change. Are you doing it to that level where we're in there, we're wiping walls, cleaning lights? Are you, like how detailed are you using? Like, explain that to us. I, we go if, if if our team members are going to touch it, we we try to identify it in the scope. If we're if we got to detach and reset light fixtures, you know, from the ceiling grid to to provide temporary lighting, you know, to keep the light systems going. You know, we have that in there. We we put that in 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 our scope of work projection. Um, if we're, you know, tearing up VCT flooring, we will have on there. You know, we're going to try to use, we're going to use mechanical means, whether it be the ride on scraper or you know a power scraper. I mean, we, we try to put means and methods in there as much as we can, so that that you know that when somebody's looking at our work, they know, okay, these guys know what they're doing. They've accounted for this, um, and so we. Our scope of work, we try to answer all the all the anticipated questions that we can up front. But that, that also opens up another thing, which is if you're talking about means, you're also now thinking your way through of this isn't a hand tool. This is a, a, a rental or a tool you have in your inventory. This is a different level. This is a $300 a day unit versus 
hand tools, which which yeah. obviously is going to impact your ROM. Yes, but we all, and we account for that in our in our ROM calculations. You know, if we're going to have special equipment, you know, if we're going to have on the, the power scrapers, you know, I, there's a box I select power scrapers and it gives me the unit cost and I project out how many days. You know, the the ROM is. And Chris, you probably have as much experience as me, if not more. I, you know, sometimes I start doubting myself on the ROMs because I, I'll look at it. I'm like, man, I it can't take that. It can't take ten guys two days to clean this. And so then I will do Xactimate. I'll I'll take make a couple, um, you know, kind of generic rooms, and I'll run some Xactimate analysis on it, and and come up with a kind of a square foot price and make sure that I'm kind of staying within those numbers. And that's, that's just the way I check and balance myself. I, I'm a, I'm a unit cost guy. Uh, my counterpart at, at signal is, a, um, he's more of a, that's uh, <laughs> eight guys for 14 hours cleaning that at, at moderate production level. And so, and remarkably he's way more accurate than I am on it, but uh, we work well together. And, and so I run my stuff and, and then he runs his, we do it um, separate from each other. Then at the end of it, we, get on a call and share our numbers and we we've always been within you know eight to ten percent of each other so um that that just kind of lets me know that we're on the on the right track but if if i have any doubt i will use exactimate to kind of um check my rom and and I'll, I'll use not only the square foot numbers but i'll look at you know an exactimate you can click on the labor summaries and, and see all the labor categories are involved i'll look at that total labor and then look at mine and you know, as if they're within fifteen to twenty percent, you know, there's that, there's that kind of variance in the economy of scale when you're using, because uh, Xactimate doesn't really account for economy of scale. So as long as they're within fifteen to twenty percent, I know I'm in, I know I'm in the right neighborhood, and and I and I'll have more and more confidence in that ROM. ROM. And then, literally, like after the first week, we'll know, you know, we've been the project management team is continuously looking at what their daily burn rates are. And, you know, they kind of understand the ebb and flow of the project. So, you know, by the end of the first week, you know, we, we readjust our calculations. And if we need to make an adjustment to it, you know, we let the claims team know right ahead, you know, because bad news does not get better with time, guys. So if you <laughs> if you see something as an issue, let let people know, you know, because um, you certainly don't want it to be in like a high kacha moment with the, with the claim side. You'd rather be up front and say, hey, you know, we're being transparent with you. This is something we didn't we didn't figure on. We didn't um, we thought that the mechanical systems were going to be able to support our operations, but you know we're going to have to bring in um, you know portable climatization uh, gear to keep this going. So you know let them know and get out in front of it and you know don't try to hide stuff because if you're trying if they if they think you're trying to hide it then they really start digging and it doesn't do you any good and it, and it slows down your your payment collection. No, it makes perfect sense. Chris, you guys do anything different? Yeah. So something I want to add on the ROM is the the reason why you're doing the ROM is to get to where you think that job's going, getting as close as you possibly can. But like Brian said, sometimes it is a wild guess as to where that's going based upon the information you see right now in this moment of time. But you want to do the best job you can not to overshoot a number and go too far or undershoot yourself because the insurance company is looking to set reserves to say, OK, this is where this this project is going. We need to set some cash aside for this project. So ROMs can be difficult. I think someone had a question in the chat based upon ROMs. So the ROMs, when you're calculating those. It's based upon your schedule of values or your rate sheet. So all those numbers are usually plugged in on an Excel spreadsheet to where it's plug and go. You just add your how many people, how many units of this and that. So something else to consider is there was a very unique project for an MSA client that we've done in the past. And coming up with the ROM, it was going to be astronomical. So we said, hey, allow us to come in, do one section. Let's say there were 30 sections to do. We did one section. We figured out exactly how long it was going to take us to do that one and what our daily burn was going to be. We figured out how much it was all the way through the end of the project. And we were almost spot on because we know exactly what it's going to take to do this. So um, now if I step outside of the ROM discussion, one of the things that I've learned at Blue Sky through a good friend, Dave Robbins, who's a coworker at Blue Sky. And he always tells us, that a he or she who has the most documentation wins. So if we get back on the documentation piece, it really is key. 
Um, where everything Brian said is pretty much the way Blue Sky does it. So I'm not going to regurgitate all of that. But I will say during a CAT event, if it's out abroad and you don't have the right people in place and maybe you're hiring new people to come on at your company or you're using third party labor and they haven't done certain key aspects of the job, you're going to have problems with assigning someone to do the psychrometrics, someone to do the moisture mapping, someone to do all these very important pieces that if you're not doing that, you will have a problem at the end of the job. So I've had some that were train wrecks because you couldn't keep up. So those were life lessons learned very early on in my career to where now you have to be so focused. You basically have to wear a GoPro on every job that you do from start to finish to capture all your data. So um, that's the last piece I'll say on that. The documentation is is paramount. Yeah, I'd say you know when, when you get into rapid hitting multiple losses. So if you're doing a cat with a lot of small losses, you, you're dealing with adjusters that may not have the experience. So getting, what does the building look like? So do you have a floor plan figured out? Do they understand that there's three rooms that are impacted, but you have to walk through an entire building. So all that needs site protection. If you're not communicating that to an adjuster, they're going to start to, or, or a consultant's going to come back. If you don't have that document and be like, well, this is where we're working. Here's where we were staged up. Here's where we're passing through a building. In Brian's case, it's like, hey, we're moving through the lobby and the elevator. That's why that's all that site protection is outside of the unit. And then we're now up on the 30th floor. And that whole hallway is now site protected because we don't want to bang walls or, or it's got higher end finishes. You have to document that, that layout of that building to articulate why there's costs outside of the unit. And it's really hard for consultants and adjusters to wrap their head around, you know, we're looking for thievery or we're looking for uh, a lot of slippage. It's like, no, no, this is part of the cost that we reduce the damage that we're going to occur on this building and, and, and trying to give somebody an opportunity to understand the building without actually being in it is key because don't forget on their, on their desk, they would normally have 80 files in a cat. Their desk now piles up to 300 files. They have no idea what they're looking at. Tell that full story. I think that's probably what Brian and Chris are, are talking about here is when they open the file and it's getting reviewed, it needs to tell the entire story. And then if it got, if, if that file has to go from the adjuster's desk to a supervisor's desk, they've never communicated with you. They have no idea what you're doing. They're going to read the file. So tell the story. And that's what the DFRs are telling for, for Brian is um, in the numbers you're playing with Brian, multiple people are reviewing it before you get a check written. And there's probably multiple signatures on the bottom of that check. There's a vice president of claims who's, signing a big check because that's their responsibility that's their authority so they have to read the file and so it's going up the, the chain of command you have to consider that is how do you get these people to pay your jobs easier is just make it easy for them to pay they're like oh all the information i need is there and brian mentioned it don't leave no questions out there so uh guys we're gonna hey, take five minutes. oh sorry go hey, ahead chris well i just want to jump in real quick before we take our break is that question in the chat said hey yeah uh, and i want to jump on that only because it says they asked, would you say it hurts or helps to slow down at the start of the job to get all this set up? And I cannot, I'm sure Brian and Chris would agree. Like when you, like the time to do all this is up front. Like you have to document, you have to have a system because I'll tell you, we've all, probably all been there, whether it's, through, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, I'm going to do this really quick. But if you need this information to the person that was asking this, they said, I know on the job site, uh, it's go, go, go as leaders, or if you're the one in charge of the project manager, the site superintendent, the general manager, whoever you are, if you if you have the privilege of leadership, it's on us to say, no, this is our company's system and we're gonna follow it. Uh, and I don't care how long it takes, if it's the system, we're gonna do it. Because when you need this information later, if a building consultant requests it, or we need it, God forbid we ever had to go to court, or the building owner, the client we're working for says, hey, can you send me this information? I wanna pay you, and you don't have it, there is no amount of time that you think you've saved that you're going to be, oh, I'm happy I saved that hour or that half of a day, uh, what's going on. So no, making sure that we set the tone for right up front, like, hey, we're going to do a daily field report. We're going to document things this way. And then if we see that not happening, we have to step in and say, I think that's one of the lessons I've learned in my career the most is that, you know, it's up to us to set the tone for whatever kind of company culture we want to have or what we want done on the job. And so, um, 
it might seem like we're slowing down, but I can't, goodness, when, it, when you need that information, you don't have it. You would do anything to have that information because then you're like, okay, how do I get myself out of this situation? Josh, you, you actually say that. So this is, I had a, uh, I was asked to be an expert witness in a file and, and I'll tell you, there was a, a discussion around what is the responsibility of the restorer and the way we're trained, and, and Josh is a, a, an IICRC trainer, is that when we talk about the job from a technical aspect, responding quickly to a job is, is of the utmost, utmost importance if you want to reduce severity. That's technically correct. But from a business perspective, it's not correct. You want to respond quickly to the job and as quick as possible document the job. But documenting is most important to your business that is part of the process. So you have to document, which means we don't run in and just start extracting. You document the current conditions of the building. That's important. And yes, you need to respond quickly to, to reduce severity, but an extra half hour isn't normally going to change the difference between your severity. It's, it's hours or days. But don't get confused with the technical correctness of we need to respond quickly and do everything really quick. Technically, yes. From a business perspective, that is the worst thing you can do for your business as a business owner or an employee is to put your business at harm's way because you're going to go save that homeowner's life. I think it was Chris that said we have the, or, or Josh said, we have the servant's mentality of we're going to get in there and help people. We do, but not at the sacrifice of our business, our profits, and our protection of our liability. So, um, Well, Chris, I'll wrap it up. We all, I, good friend of you and I, David Sweet, who's an instructor in the industry, a consultant, David one time said it, and it really hit me when he was training and I was sitting in his classes, you know, really all our business is, is an acceptance and like, what's our risk tolerance? Like we're, when we start to do the work, we are accepting a certain level of risk in exchange for a certain amount of money. And so if we don't document everything, then what we're saying is, Hey, I'm willing to accept even more risk for the same amount of money, hoping that it doesn't go sideways. And David does a phenomenal job uh, of explaining that and making sure people understand that. Yeah, 100%. And that's a good point, Randy, is the uh, is the cat's not going to change. When we get there, the severity of, of 30 minutes isn't making much of a difference. And I'd argue it still doesn't make a difference in, a, in a, a water damage where you're talking a number of hours. That 30 minutes or 40 minutes is about for you to respond properly you need to document what's there before. That's that's part of your job. And, and you know, we're not obligated to take every job that comes through the door. Maybe if you sign a contract, that, that's a little different, but you are obligated to protect your company or you're not in business. And so you don't have to worry about it a year from now. That's a big deal. Brooke's on, she's got a list of questions for us. Yes, we have tons of questions that have come in. So thanks to everyone who has been submitting them. Um, I'll kick things off with one about uh, TNM. So how do you handle insurance refusing TNM, even though client client slash insured executed TNM rates and contract before work begun? Several examples of this in Hurricane Ian slash Nicole in Florida. Well, I got to go guys. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I saw you um, come up, you, you, you got to answer. Yeah, so um, there's nothing in the policy that says how uh, the contractor is supposed to bill the insured. So, I mean, our contract, if our contract states time and material, that's how we're going to bill. Um, we have done, and I have personally done this on several occasions, say, you know, I'll put it in exact to me. Um, and if, if you capture everything in Xactimate, you're going to be, you know, you can be 15 to 20, 22% higher than, than time and material, but you have to, you have to track everything in Xactimate. You know, you have to, if you're, if you've got a technician hauling, uh, hauling equipment up and down a flight of stairs, you know, you need to know how much time it takes him to walk up five flights of stairs, carrying two pieces of uh, two, two uh, fans or uh, air movers or, or, two workers carrying up uh, one air scrubber or one dehumidifier. So you have to know those true calculations and, and convert that to Xactimate successfully and then present them to them. And, you know, I've, I've done that many times. I've had the response, well, I'm not going to pay anything but Xactimate. And then you handle the Xactimate that's 20% higher. Well, then all of a sudden they want to pay your time and material rate. So it, that, that's how we handle that. Historically, we, we've not had too much pushback on, 
I'm doing time patrol, but you know, to be fair, we're we're not we're not doing residential work either. Um, so ours are traditionally commercial, and and um, those adjusters and claims so or consultants are used to seeing time of material. So it's a little bit easier for us. Yeah, that's the same for us at Blue Sky. Um, exactly what Brian said. I mean, the, there's only a handful of times where we have had to accommodate someone pushing back hard enough, and it's usually on the residential side. Easy as that. But yeah, usually commercial, everything else, time and materials every single time. And we do gently push back in a very professional manner so that they, uh, they pay those rates. Yeah, the, the reality is, is, is your time and material is your rate and your efficiency of doing the work. If you were to come in and put Xactimate at the same rate and adjust the efficiency to what you actually experience on site, you should get the same number. So it really shouldn't matter if you're playing the system properly, it wouldn't matter whether it's T&M or unit pricing. Unit pricing, if you knew the efficiency, you could give a price ahead of time, whereas with rate and material, you're picking it up after. But if you're both looking at it after, then you say, well, this took 10 hours to do cleaning a room. You change the efficiency in unit pricing to equal the same 10 hours and you get to the same number. It's just, it's just they're using it as a pricing tool, not as an actual uh, estimating or, or um, tool that, that, that's actually focusing on what the actual work was done in the field. But the numbers should not be different if you're changing it to reflect the actual conditions of the field. Um, how do you get around it? Your contract's a good place to start. What did your contract say you were going to bill and, and what was your rate schedule? Uh, a lot of contracts don't have that defined as how you're billing. So that's where you get some uh, ambiguity on, on how you're charging, but it would be more so, is there in your contract a rate? Is it going to cost the admin time $120 an hour to convert it from T&M to Xactimate? If there's that, you factor that in and uh, I've seen file reviews where it was asked, you know, we want it in this format and there's a surcharge for that. And if they want to pay it to find out what Brian's going to tell you is 20% more than it is what it is. Well, but to it's Chris's an point, yeah, well, Chris brought up a, a, a great um, little snippet earlier when he talked about um, Blue Skies going through their, you know, they go through and adjust for rates. We do ours at the beginning of every hurricane season. And so for us, uh, because I'm the Xactimate guy, I, I pull uh, 15 markets in, uh, you know, throughout the United States, and then I put 15 premium markets. And when I say markets, it'll be like Wichita, Kansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, a premium market would be like Philadelphia, New York, Miami, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco. I pull all those, and and I use, I populate them with our rate sheets. Uh, so I'll have, you know, a drywall labor, a drywall labor, painting labor, framing labor, um, water technician, uh, all those different components get in there and, and we take the national average for the, the traditional markets. And then we build our rate sheets from that. And then our premium markets, we have, we have a bifurcated rate schedule. It's, you know, a traditional market and then we have a premium market and, and we validate all those pricing through Xactimate. So we know that uh, going into the event, our flatline rate schedule is going to be less than Xactimate. Interesting. That's a, that's an interesting strategy. Thanks, guys. Um, we had a number of questions come in about who to bill. So some people saying they take payment directly from the customer or bill the insurance company. Um, do you guys want to? Kind of explain your yeah. perspective um and then a kind of a follow-up sorry go go ahead Brian. No, go ahead go ahead go ahead go ahead i was just gonna go add ahead. a kind of a, a part two to that question is if there is no insurance involved do you do self-pay or walk away yeah so our contract our we invoice who our contract who, who signed our contract so it traditionally it's it's going to be the risk manager or the cfo or you know even even the ceo and our, our billing practices are no different for somebody that's doing a self-pay than, than um, somebody's where they're presenting their um, claim for reimbursement from the insurance side. So we go through the same documentation process, same daily field report process, same same uh, billing process where you know the, the 
data is kept captured at the site. It's it's packaged up by accounting team, and then it's reviewed by the 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 assistant project manager, project manager, and the project director that's that's over that job. And then and then it gets pushed out as quickly as possible, and and that that's how we stay out in front of the building. But it's it's there's no no change in billing practice from insurance related to to uh, self pay. I think that's standard internationally. It's it's the contract is with the insured and they're ultimately responsible. It's like going to the dentist. If the dentist says, "Hey, there, you know, you're responsible for whatever the insurance coverage doesn't cover," and there's twenty percent that's not covered, you pay the difference. It's not really different in in residential, although it, it it's we treat it that way. But if the insurance company is not paying for percentage of your services, ultimately you don't take the haircut. It's their responsibility. It's their property. Uh, you perform that service or that value of services to the property. They're responsible for the difference. If their insurance company says, no, we don't pay anything. Ultimately they owe you your bill. So from a legal standpoint, I'd say that's the, that, that's your position. Talk to your lawyer though. All right, Brooke, any more we got for yeah. you? Yeah, I'll do one more for now. Um, so it, is there a vetting process you guys recommend for which jobs you take on or which jobs you leave when there's an influx of jobs coming in? Yeah, I, from the signal perspective, um, man, we've relationships, uh, relationships that who the client is, credit risk. Uh, you know, if, if we think they're going to be, uh, if it's going to be a profitable project, um, is there a performance risk, um, size and type? Those are, those are just some of the, uh, the key factors to look up at the, at the very beginning. Um, you know, we've taken projects outside of our comfort zone when it's, we wanted to penetrate a, a specific market. Um, we've taken unusual projects when they were uh, something that could build a resume. Like a, uh, we did a church on St. Croix that was not a particularly large project. But it's not often you can say that you worked on a cathedral that was in the you know uh, national historic registry. Um, you know, we prominent locations. You know, if it's a high traffic area, we'll we'll take a smaller job in a in a high traffic area, so we can put a fifty three foot trailer out there to to broadcast that we're in the area and we're you know that we're here here to help. Um, you know, so you know those are some secondary considerations, but our 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 core considerations are you know the relationship who the client is, the credit risk, profitability risk, and then the performance risk. Those are the, those are the key factors for us. But I, you know, each company is gonna be a little bit different. We're set up, we're set up to really be a, a boutique large loss firm. So somebody that's doing residential um, or has, you know, smaller project where they're a hundred thousand dollar or, you know, $150,000 project are gonna look at things differently. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, if there's anything else you wanna, any more content you wanna go through, go for it and I'll uh, crank through a bunch more questions at the end, there's a ton coming in, so. Perfect, hey okay, guys, Josh had a uh, emergency he had to step away from, so he, he's gone for the uh, for the rest of this. Um, uh, I'll have some contact information for him at the end if you guys need to get a hold of him or wanna get a hold of him and his organization. Uh, hey, Brian, we had one question come in, I just saw, could you expand on the performance risk meaning uh, what you mean by that? Well, so performance risk tusk is is if unreasonable expectation from the client. I mean, uh, uh, one of my employers, um, Cole, um, Cole Department Stores was one of our one of our key accounts, and then they had. They, I mean, I, I took a John boat into one of their um, <laughs> one of their buildings. And the guy said, I want to be selling, this is on a Saturday morning. He said, I want to be selling shoes by next Monday. And I'm just like, there, there's no way it's, it's, you know, water has been in every square inch of this building. And he goes, his response to me was, you know, six months ago, you guys had us selling shoes in a, in a week after a tornado ripped out at the ceiling. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a different loss. So those, that's a performance risk, something where you have unreasonable expectations or, you know, is it in a, you know, highly industrial, like when we do industrial work, we have to look at, you know, the, the OSHA, OSHA issues, you know, 
uh, is it going to impact our ability to perform well in here? And so then you then you have to really kind of change the expectation of your client. So those are all the things that we when we look at performance risk. That for us, that's something that look even if we knock this out of park, are we going to be behind what their timeline is? And then so if you knock it out of park and you're behind time, then they're going to be upset. So then you have you know risk to collecting your invoice. So those are all things that we you know, have to look at. It's um, you know that's that's all they go hand in hand to having a successful project. Because if you can do you can do perform well on everything and the client loves you and but if you don't collect one hundred percent of your invoice or you know ninety percent of your invoice, um, you know there's the fingers get pointed back at you and, and we want to avoid that. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Hey, when we're talking about um... When we're talking about performance, one of the things, is, and, and I think this ties in with with cash flow and, and cash flowing, is when are you when are you applying a stop to the work or a warning that you're going to stop work? Uh, what are the situations, or when are the yeah? What would be the situations or the circumstances that would cause you to warn the client that you're not going to continue to perform the work? Uh, or that you will apply a stop work to a job. It, it probably doesn't happen often, but uh, do you guys have any internal, you know, guardrails that you put up of like when we're going to pull the trigger on, on pulling off a job? You want me to go first, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> sure, go ahead. It's just so, now, so. I know. I tell you, it's, it's such a unique situation, right? Because we don't want to have to do that. We want to be good partners for our clients. But there are the times I, I know initially and a little bit later on in this discussion, we're going to be talking about uh, contracts and how, how it's written, pay terms, all those things. So if you get to one of those points where your pay terms are not being met and you still have leverage, that means you got plenty of work to do. You need to have that conversation and be very direct, very professional and say, listen, because of how this was written and you guys have not paid this amount. We have to stop this work. You guys have got to be just as good of partners to us as we are to you. So those those can be very difficult conversations, but they have to take place early. Don't wait to the end of a project. Yeah, just to reiterate what uh, Chris said, do not be afraid to stop work. Uh, you know, it's it's a tool in your toolbox, but you know, it's one of those that you. It's a tool of last resort, in my opinion. I mean. You know, uh, keeping open the dialogue with the with the owner and the on the financial requirements of the project. You know, that's part of of knowing what your daily burn rate is. Um, you know, and also knowing what your pinch points are in the project. You know, maybe you're at a phase where you have to buy. You know, you're going to be on the hook to purchase some large mechanical equipment or something for them. Um, you know, when you're coming up to that, that's that's a good point for you to say. You know, we need to we need to look at you know payments from you because you know we're we're uh, you know, we're, we're getting out over our skis financially here where we're carrying, you know, where we're carrying the lion's share of the money. Um, you know, when you start doing these larger projects, you have to realize that you are, uh, you're the bank for them. You're, you're carrying all that. And unfortunately the insurance companies don't like to pay the interest that you have to pay on, you know, on your working capital. So uh, that those are all things that you got to have to bear in mind when you're, when you're looking at stopping the job. Yeah, it, and guys, you know, Brian mentioned this is is your if you're over your skis financially, it doesn't mean that you're at a hundred thousand dollars. Like it could be, you're a new company and twenty five grand is is you know every dollar. It, it, that's a huge loss for you. There's nothing wrong with going to an insurance company or the client and talking to them about when you're getting paid. And it, you know, if you don't get that twelve grand, you don't have any more money. So for you, that's getting over your skis. There's nothing wrong with going in and and don't let the adjuster. Uh, teach you the business model. Well, I guess you're not really a true restore. Hey, everyone gets into financial ta uh, tight spots. Just know where yours is and and how far you can take this. I think it's it's key whether you're doing a cat or uh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry guys, or or you're doing a cat or you're going in and you're you're changing up the the way you're doing business uh, in smaller losses or or a large loss for you. And uh, Brian and I were talking and, and, you know, there's times when, when a $50,000 loss comes in and, and for someone that's a large loss and absolutely you're going to treat it 
with all the same rules and procedures uh, to be able to execute. No, Chris, you mentioned uh, you mentioned we were going in and and talking contracts. Uh, we've touched on it, but that is the critical thing: is to make sure you have your clauses. And you guys are both running corporates. I know Josh left, but um, you know Rainbow has, I think, standard contracts, and then you have to regionalize it for each area. For you guys, where are your big? Let's talk about like maybe the big five points of your contract or areas that you're you're really focused on making sure are tight. I mean, obviously, the, depending on where you're working, sometimes you have to actually have the price in that contract. I think California is that way, right? Um, so price is definitely important or whatever type of estimating you're doing, if it's uh, to be determined based upon time of material rates. But the other important parts are making sure that, number one, it's clearly written in your work authorization by an attorney for appropriate areas. You've already mentioned that. That is key. It can't just be someone in your company that dabbled in legal or anything along those lines. It needs to be it's pretty, pretty specific. But making sure you've got your, your down payment, if there's going to be one, right? How much is that going to be? What's it based upon? And then having those other payments throughout. Uh, Brian mentioned earlier, 25, 50, 75, 90, and then hold on to that last, you know, 10% as retainage or whatever it might be. Every company is different. Every job can be different within the same company. It really just depends. So you need to clearly have all that and understand it. Now, something that's also important is if there is an MSA client, that looks completely different sometimes. You have to know. And if you're in a larger company, you're going to have hundreds of MSAs. You've got to know where you can go to find that information or know the right person to call so that you don't stick your foot in your mouth, so to speak, by writing a contract that's completely adverse to what that MSA is. You'll just create a lot of issues. And that's like strike one and anything else you do on the claim, they're just going to add that against you. And that's how things spiral out of control for your customer service piece. So there's a lot tied to the contracts. That makes sense. Brian, you got anything to add or is that pretty much? That, that's he, Payment terms are, are the biggest thing for us. And then, you know, make sure that your documentation requirements follow what your contracts, you know, if, you're, if your contracts has a, an addendum saying that you're going to um, handle content separately, you know, make sure that you track all the contents handling separately. Um, just always ensure that you're, and, it, and it's good to audit, have your accounting team audit your um, invoice versus the language in the contract to make sure that you're compliant with um, with the actual con uh, contract requirements. And that's those are the key factors to it, just payment terms and, and make sure you're billing in accordance with the, uh, with the contract. And one other piece of that is how do you prove that we're 50% when we create that invoice and send it to you? You need to be able to back that up and have something that shows exactly what you've done to get to that point or already have it laid out with the client in writing when we get to x and that's where project schedules really come into play because sometimes you can follow that project schedule and as soon as you're checking it off the client has something written tangible that they can look at touch feel whatever that they know yes this is where we are i owe this money that's another huge piece yeah no it's it I think when you're a smaller operator or you're newer into this business, you're not necessarily applying the same pressures that you guys might have or the same communication. So, you know, you you start the job and maybe you're willing to take on a quarter million dollars of financial burden before you get the first check. But if you're a smaller company, you might only take on 50,000 or 25,000 of burden and then you need that first check. And so the communication is, Hey, I'm going to need this money up front, and I I, I know we I've had adjusters in the past that would like to, to to grind you. Well, why do you need a progress payment? We'll just pay you at the end. No, because that's how we're doing this project. And if you're getting that resistance at the beginning, you might that might be a red flag that you may not be able to handle that job or that adjuster or that client to the end. Because if you're trying to get your money during the process when they're most needing you, it's probably going to be harder to get the money at the end when they don't need you. But uh, it's well, interesting. On, on time and material projects, um, you know, the, the billing, the accurate and timely billing are, I mean, tantamount to your success. So if, if you don't, if it's not laid out in your contract that you're going to be billing biweekly or you know, at a minimum monthly, um, 
you know, you need the, it's best if you notify the client, you know, tell them verbally when they're signing the contract, but also follow up with an email like, hey, just, you know, just to follow up, we are, we are going to be invoicing you bi-weekly or, you know, even weekly on some, some cases if your burn rate's high enough. Um, but, you know, just be transparent with them. Let, let them know that it's coming because what you don't want is two weeks in, they get the first bill for $150,000 and they go into panic mode. So, that? and that's, that's part of knowing what your daily burn rates are so that you can always be transparent with the, with the client, with your, with their accounting team or their accounts payable team, let them know, look, at the end of the week, I'm going to be handing you a bill for, you know, we think it's going to be between a hundred and $120,000 or, you know, whatever the amount is. What, what's your terms? What, what do you guys run for terms on there? And, and, you know, or, or have you seen, because you guys might not be running it today, but for smaller operators, like you're, you're getting to a cash point. And then what's your, what's typically your terms of like getting that cash back in so that if you miss that point, now you're talking about, Hey, we're running out of money as a company. We may have to stop work because we just can't keep funding your, your project. What, what kind of windows do you guys look at? For us, it's net. Our, our typical terms are net 30. And then there was with, with uh, institutional clients like a, like government or, you know, when there's a real focus on um, speed to, you know, completion, you know, then, then you'll, you know, bill weekly and offer a, you know, a quick pay discount. Um, so, but those, you know, we generally, it's 30 days from the date of the invoice and the clock, the clock starts ticking the moment that invoice goes out. Yeah. And Chris, are you guys different? No, I mean, we do that too, but I would say on some of the smaller things to, to kind of hit the broad spectrum here is you, you have to fill out each job. So mitigation jobs, it might be, um, if it's insurance related, you're going to be going for the deductible up front, right? Making sure you're at least getting that. If it's recon, you may be doing something slightly different. Sometimes what we do, and it can be a different percentage across the board, depending on the size of the job, you might go with 25% down payment, 15%, 10%. Whatever it might be, it just you got to think it through, and you have to. It has to make sense for that particular job, because um, everything is different. I mean, everything's unique to itself, so it, you can't just be one one line across the board for everything. Everything's different. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, I was going to say I was going to add one more thing to it real fast because it, it kind of really all ties together. There's a question. That, um, it says, how do you handle large loss claims and and that and have involvement with PAs or IAs or really anything? So I think even what we're talking about now kind of speaks to that. One thing for me that helps get us paid quickly when a consultant or in a, you know different IA, PA, whatever it might be, because I know there's some consultants on this call, is having a clerk of the works. Now, I've seen some insurance or some uh, restoration companies are like, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with a clerk of the work. For me personally, I've seen it actually helps us. It speeds everything up. Could you, could you explain possible. clerk of the works, Chris? Yeah, Just so a, a clerk of the works is typically they work with the consultant agency and their line of work is to literally come in every single day when we're there. They stay until we're there and they do periodic checks, take their own photos they're counting personnel. They're looking around the property, see if the personnel is doing what they said they're going to be doing. So they're there to justify what our bill is outside of us justifying it. So the fact if we can get a clerk of the works in the very beginning on a larger project to come in and justify on their own, everything we're doing, everything they're seeing, it all lines up. And at the end of the day, it gets us paid much faster versus us trying to put everything together and have someone spend weeks or months going through our documentation. They're already doing it while they're there. So that helps with pay terms, having all your documentation, having them justify exactly and say, this is exactly right. All the equipment, all the personnel, everything checks and it speeds you up. So, so one of the interesting things that tie into what Brian and Chris were saying is if you're dealing with an IA and they're a large loss IA or they're, they're, they're an experienced IA. Sometimes you can tell them, hey, listen, our burn rate is 25 grand a week and we think the job's going to be five weeks out. Can you order us checks for 25 grand? And then when we, we'll meet you on a Friday, you want the adjuster to request payment for the $125,000 in four individual checks and then be like, hey, we'll square up at the end. Because if you can come in and, and prepare the, like that's part of that communication is you're not getting money ahead of time if you're not communicating. 
Well, we had a seasoned adjuster. It was like, tell me what you think you're going to need. And it's like, hey, can you order in four checks in advance? And he's like, yeah, I'll have them in my office. You come in, present me the paperwork, and I'll release a check to you. That was like the best way to work with an adjuster. But you had to be prepared and have the conversation up front being, hey, our burn rate's going to be this. When can we get cash? He's like, well, how do you want it split? Uh, weekly? Done. How do you, when do you want to pick it up? Fridays? Done. And so you just had to have the communication. And, uh, I'm going to find, I'm going to say it's harder to find those adjusters these days, but it wasn't as hard before um, where they would be, you know, willing to write those checks and the company adjusters, sometimes they can write the checks on the spot. So uh, depending on who you're dealing with, it's, it's an interesting concept of letting them know where you think you're going to land and, and try to get those, the checks written by the insurance company, because they're just looking to someone to review your paperwork and approve them. So if you can help get that process started and ask for that, sometimes they're not thinking about how important it is to you. And so you're not net 30, you're net the day you hand in the invoice and maybe a week out, right? You can get it the following week. So uh, plus they feel good if there's a little bit of cash at the end that they can then claw back or they've got something to hold on to in case they made a mistake along the way. So uh, guys, you know what? We're going to move on to closing out the job and then we can come in and take questions uh, in there. But demobilizing is is as much of a strategy as mobilizing do you do you leave the cat all out do you are you wrap up in one week and pull everything do you stay with a minimized crew and and tail off what are some of the strategies you guys have done in cats uh, brian you're doing larger stuff but you guys might do a number of large projects uh chris what, what are you guys seeing there like how are you guys considering your demobilization as part of your strategy are you are you having those discussions at the beginning of the job being, hey, when we make X number of dollars, that's jump off point one. And then if the crews are healthy and, and feeling good, we'll stay for another few weeks. Like, what are you guys looking at for for the demobilization strategy? Maybe let's talk big picture and then we can get granular uh, into it. So for us, you know, we, we don't want to start downsizing too early because, you know, our, our sales team are in, they're in the geographic area. So actively pursuing, you know, potential leads. So as, uh, you know, as the first couple of projects start to close out, we actually keep that equipment in, in the, you know, in theater for us. Uh, and, but then as, you know, we come to basically where we think we're at about 50% complete for all of our projects, then we kind of start as, as projects close out, you know, we'll make some, we'll transfer some resource, manpower resources and then start pulling assets off. Um, you know, and at the end, our, our demobilization team usually considers, uh, consists of a, you know, a few people from the leadership team and one of the logistics guys, and then a, a supervisor or two to run the, our general labor to pack up everything and, and start getting it back. You know, just, you know, there's a big rush to get it down there as fast as possible where you may have to use a hot shot or something like that, or an expedited freight system or, you know, or uh, air transport. But going back, there's really, unless you're going to another event, um, you know, like what's happened in 2004 and, you know, in, in 17 with Maria and, and the others, um, you go, uh, you know, you go on the, le the most economical way to get it, to get it back home. And if it's a shared freight option or something like that, then, you know, uh, you, you want to do all those, but our trailers don't leave, they don't leave our event unless they're manifested and supplied just like they were when they showed up. So, you know, our, um, probably a lot like blue skies are, you know, we have equipment, uh, a combination of equipment and consumables and hand tools to basically spike any job to get it going. And then, you know, of course you, you can drop ship from that, that point on. But when we demobilize the trailer that leaves there looks exactly as it did when it came out. And then there's a complete manifest that must, you know, has to match up with what the man, what it showed up with, uh, before it goes back out. If it doesn't, it gets sent to our Detroit office, um, and then it, it gets a, um, filled out there. But for the most part, 99% of the time, they, they leave just as they showed up um, to the job site. That, and, and the purpose of that is to get the accounting figured out so that you've captured all that revenue that took the stock, the truck? Yeah, yeah it's, it's part of the timely and accurate billing. And then also, you know, that's, that's a soft cost. And, you know, that's, you know, the, the labor to pack all that stuff up. While you're there, it, it goes into our mobilization, demobilization bucket. When we do a, when we do time and material billing, we have a mobilization costs are projected as a percentage of the total contract value. Um, so we, 
those costs get absorbed and then um, deferred out to the client based on, you know, the percentage of the, that there's the percentage of use based on the, the size of project that they have. Makes sense. Yeah. The, what I'll add to it, I mean, it's, it's the same across the board for blue sky, but something to think about usually when you put trailers in play, you've got equipment trailers, you've got materials and consumables trailers. And what we'll find is sometimes it, it's a run on the store. It could be parked at a specific job site and meant for that job site, but you'll have people that are, two miles up the road, they need stuff. They're going to make a run on that trailer. Everyone knows the same codes. They're getting in there. So someone has to be there writing down what's being pulled out. So it goes to those jobs and is charged appropriately so that when you are restocking these trailers or you're missing equipment, you know where to go find it. it there's so many little pieces. I know we're not able to touch on every single part of cap prep or what happens during a cap. Some of those things you're going to learn on your own and you'll never forget it and never make that mistake again, just like we have. But um, yeah, restocking is completely important. Same like kind and quality, get everything back on it because you may be hauling it back to wherever the central location that is housed and something else happening and it's got to go somewhere. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a trailer show up and they didn't take care of it. And you're, you're pretty, you're up a creek without a paddle to put it any other way, you're screwed. You are not going to be able to handle your job and you're going to let the client down immediately. So that usually doesn't happen too often, but it has happened in the past. So just everything's got to be on point. So, yeah, so is, that one of the, is, is that one of the things that you guys do is, is, is build a, like a, uh, an intake outtake uh, system where, where you have a, a, you have basically a, a a stores manager there at the, at the trailers who's accounting for everything and making sure it's going out and billing that to the job. Is that, is that how you guys are doing? I know that's how we did it. I'm not sure if that's how you guys would be doing it as well. Yeah, no, we, we did it the same way, but you know what, what Chris says is, you know, that's not, that's not being a good teammate, letting a trailer show up to a job that is not in the same shape it was when you received it. I mean, that, that you won't last very long at, at, at our organization if, if you're not, you know, thinking of your, your fellow, uh, teammates. Um, yeah. so send, sending a, sending a trailer that's done, that's not properly prepared is it's, a man, it's, it's a no, no, you, you don't, you're, you're hindering your operations when, when you do that. Yeah. Um, and, and materials and, and consumables are one thing there, right? Um, yeah. sometimes they get that part right, but they forget to change the filters in the, in the machines that were used on a mold job. <laughs> that's not yeah. good. So you got to think yeah, about all so the details the, down to strapping in the equipment. Yep. The, I mean, believe it or not, decontaminating equipment, make sure it's clean and serviceable and all the filters and change. It's, it's a huge expense because if, if you're not capturing it and assigning it properly, that's again, that's, that's part of your margin erosion and it, it impacts your profitability overall for the event and, you know, and let alone for the whole year. So this is actually interesting because we're talking, you know, large, large trailers where, where you've got huge amounts, but when you look at your day-to-day -day operation, this applies to, I, it would kill me when, when you come back and you got a dirty truck, nothing's in it. And the crew gets a call at two in the morning and the other team's like, Oh, I'll just do it in the morning. But that truck has to roll in the middle of the night and the team is out of away from their family, out of bed and frustrated that the, the truck's not been prepped to go. Uh, we had the same rule as, as you bring that truck in and before you go home, you get prepared for the next roll. And that was just the cost that was built into the job that you just came off because that's getting the truck ready for the company. If you don't do it, it becomes an overhead to the company. And to Brian's point, it's margin erosion. So a lot of the things you're hearing, this isn't that you're doing things different for a cat. This is how you should be doing your day-to-day -day operations and people should be in the mindset. It's just scaled up. It's a 52 or 53 foot truck, not a, an eco van, but it's, it's, it's all the same practices. So. I like one this guy. Is, yeah, one thing that I found that helps, uh, there's a lot of Blue Sky offices that have a bin system. So let's say there's 10 bins. Each one has its own number. And every time you look on the, the clean shelf, there are 15 number one bins. And they all have a lock on it. So every vehicle is loaded with one to 10 bins. And as soon as a tag is cut off of one, we know something's missing. So that bin comes off, gets set to the side to be reprepped and relocked. And they just grab that number back off the clean shelf, back onto the van, van stock, ready to go. 
So there are a lot of systems that you can put into place for your normal routine day-to-day -day type of stuff where that's not always uh, easy on a cat trailer, but um, plenty of things that can be done. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Our, code, our code technology is a big player for us. Uh, yep. you know, guys, as when somebody comes to a job and or from, from another job to, and they try to pilfer equipment or materials from someplace else to Chris's point, you know, that, that information is scanned and we know exactly where, what job that, that needs to be costed to that way. That way, the one job you're pulling off is not negatively impacted. Um, and, you know, you have a true accounting of all the, the consumables and billable items. Yeah. So hey, we're, we're moving to legal here. And, and I got a question in there from Jordan who said, I'm in a situation, a client was underinsured and used my $1.2 million bill to get the policy limits on the claim now won't pay. And I'm in a lawsuit with the client and they are demanding that to only pay whatever my expenses are plus 20%. How would you handle this situation? My contract clearly states otherwise, but I'm still in this mess. And uh, and it's probably one of those things where it's, you know, it's the value of time and value of money is they were, they would have been willing to probably pay you cash if you were willing to walk away. Now you're at the end of the job and the value of your services are a lot less. Um, strategies around that, guys. And then I want to talk about the legal a little bit more, but it was just a, a question that came in. I wanted you guys to, to hear and 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 potentially provide a little bit of insight or lessons learned. <laughs> How strong is your contract? First of all, that's the first question I would have to ask. Yeah. yeah so if the, con if the contract is strong, that, right? elaborate on why, because it, I think most people don't realize the contract is the underlying backbone of your, of your job. Yeah. So, so, you know, was there a scope of work attached to your contract? Were there payment terms attached to your contract? Was there a rate schedule that was initialed and, and reviewed by the client attached to your contract? Um, you know, if, the more, as as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, the more whoever has the most documentation wins. So uh, if all that's documented up front, you're in a much stronger legal position than you were if you have kind of a, a back of a napkin contract without all these details um, spelled out. If you're in that position, your negotiating um, leverage is way down. Uh, you know, for me, I would go put a lien on that property uh, immediately and and start the process that way. You got to you have to protect your rights to to recoup. You know, at least at least your what your your upfront costs are. I mean, because that I've had a I've had a couple of friends go out of business because one big job that they had to have um, kind of put them over their comfort um, comfort level in the financial world and, and they ended up having to close up shop when they didn't when they didn't collect um, at least their expenses so you have to be mindful about that I wouldn't I would protect myself at all costs right now yeah I think that that's the importance so when you look at taking a contract or taking a job I'm not a big fan of, of financing the whole thing um, and that's that's a tough position to be in. Even if you have the line that's that's able to handle it, it's how much risk are you taking on the job? I think Chris said we're we're dividing the risk here. Well, we're let's look at our risk as two hundred thousand dollars of one point two. If we're not paid on there, why are we taking the other million dollars of risk? And um, I'll tell you, if you want to reach out to me, Jordan, um, I'll, I'll get you our emails. But if you want to reach out to me after, uh, I have no problem taking a look at your stuff and seeing where where you might be with that um sometimes there's a few things you can do using the standards that'll help you um but that one i i feel for you that, that's a shitty spot to be in and uh and no doubt you're losing some sleep over it so guys when you look at legal i, I think it's important you know we often say legal stuff and, and i think it gets misconstrued or you say well what if it, what if you go to court the court's the final process the the legal starts at signing the contract then the next chapter of legal is get me my paycheck or get me my check and then the next part is you didn't give it to me so we lean the building and and we're taking you know forceful actions to get paid and then you go from there you get to uh, demand letters and then you're getting into mediation or appraisal uh, or dispute resolution and then you're getting into pre-trial and depositions, and then you get to trial if you ever make it there. I've I've only had two of my 
my jobs ever get to trial and, and close before they ever got in. So, uh, you know, the legal process is when you always say, and Brian, ex police officer, so he always says, hey, when we go to court, it's not court, it's the process to get to court that you have to be prepared for, which is like leaning a property is meaning you're not getting paid. Um, how fast do you guys do that? So if you have net 30, and I gotta ask you this, cause I think this is an issue. You've got a contract says net 30, and let's say your lien dates are 45 out. And so net 30, what's your process to collect to like that 45th day? Because you have to file the lien. So where, if you miss that date, you don't get the lien filed, right? Or in some states or, or provinces you can't file. How are you handling that? Cause that's a touchy subject, applying a lien to a building when they said, Hey, we're going to get you the money, Brian, but we just haven't written the check. It's like, all right, what do you want me to do? So how do you guys handle that? I, I mean, clear and concise communication with the owner, uh, you know, with the owner or owner's rep, just let them know we can't move forward past this date because, uh, you know, I, I've got to file a lien to protect my rights. You understand what, that I have to protect my rights uh, for my company. So you just have to have that frank conversation with them and say, look, I'm going to apply a lien. And the moment that you pay us, I'm going to, I'm going to take the lien off, but I've got to do this to protect my, to protect our country, our, our company. I don't own the company. The, the people I work for do, and, and you know, I treat their money like it's my money, so I have to do this. And that's, you know, you just have to have the frank conversation with them. It's, it's not, it's not always pleasant. And I've been called a lot of names in the past, but you know, it's just what you have to do to protect, you know, to protect the ownership and the company. Hundred percent, Chris. Are you guys doing anything different? Or are you same thing? No, we're the same thing. I mean the. The biggest thing that we try to do is get everyone comfortable with talking about money, right? Every time you have an opportunity to be in front of your client, if there's anything owed, now's that time. Hey, do all the pleasantries up front, but in closing, be like, hey, by the way, I've got a couple of jobs that we've worked. We're still owed X. Just get in a, a routine or a habit of having conversations about that money. It's not taboo to talk about it. They are biz they're in business to make money themselves, and they already know all this stuff. They don't want you asking, but we have to. So um, if it rolls reverse, they would be asking us for the money. So just like everyone else, you got to talk about it. You got to put the liens in place. And uh, one of the biggest points I wanted to make on the contracting side, sometimes we forget little steps, right? Does anybody know what a fully executed document looks like? It means that everything's filled in. All parties have signed it and all parties have a copy of it. I, I've been to court before where something wasn't in line and it wasn't my project. I just happened to be the, the poor gopher that had to go do it that one time. And uh, sure enough, we lost because the contract wasn't fully executed. So those are the little things. Now, granted, that was a much smaller loss. You start getting into the millions of dollars. There's some problems to be had. Somebody's going to be in trouble somewhere. Yeah. Pay the money for your lawyers to review your, your paperwork flow and, uh, and make sure you get on that. All right, guys, let's let's move over to question and answer period. I see some stacking up here. Um, before we do, guys, I'm gonna just flip up here. I I want to share this with. Uh, yeah. All right, there we go. Uh, I just give you guys our contact information. These guys are are you know the juggernauts in the industry, and I want you to be able to get a hold of them. Uh, sharing my screen here. There we go. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Chris or Blue Sky, you guys can do it here. Th this is if you're trying to take on a job, but you're just not in a position necessarily to be able to handle it. Uh, you do have resources. These guys are willing. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, about you know them coming in and, and helping out. Um, both of them are, have been gracious enough to say, hey, you know, in the event that you need. You need a call to make, call Chris or, or call Brian. Let me see if I can move that forward. Brian's contact information is here. Um, reach out to them if you need to use their 800 number. Uh, we'll, we'll let them plug at the end, but uh, I'll tell you this. If you're in need, you're handling something you don't know if you can handle or you get a big job and it's just like, man, I hit the lottery, but there's no way I can do it. Give these guys a call and, and pair up with them and, uh, and they'll walk you through it. And then if you guys need to get hold of Josh, um you're interested in a franchise or you want to work with his network or or just contact him and pick his brain there's his contact information as well and uh, these guys are more than willing to to jump out and give you a hand 
All right, Brooke, what do we got for uh, questions? And guys, link in with them. Jump on their LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you can find them. Uh, there's their emails. And, uh, and if you're not linked in with me, make sure you link in with me as well. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so lots of questions. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, first one, how do you handle large loss claims that have involvement with an on-site PA or IA? For us, it's the same documentation process, same execution project uh, process. The only, the only where it gets a little, um, a little wonky sometimes is, you know, a lot of times the public adjusters think that they're the ones running the project and they're running the claims process. They're not really running the project. So you just have to be mindful that sometimes their agenda is, does not necessarily align up with the owner's priorities and the project's priorities. Um, so you, again, you have to have frank conversations up front and kind of let them know, uh, you know, that you want to collaborate with them. Um, but, you know, just make sure that you're doing your end of the project the way you should and following industry standards and following your, your core documentation um, principles. Yeah, I would say as long as you're doing everything you know you should, documenting prop documenting properly following all the standards everything will fall in line most of the time and not everyone that comes onto a claim such as consultants i think one of uh the people have already mentioned they're not always your adversary now you do have to use caution sometimes because people are not there for your best interest so as long as you're doing the right things and documenting everything you'll be in a good space that's beautiful. Great, thanks. Next one, um, how would you guys incentivize employees for cat loss mobilizations? I love to talk about this one. Uh, I've been a part of that from different levels in my career where cat pay can be really awesome. And, uh, you know, there's per diem you have to think about. That's also an, an incentivization to where people will go and, <laughs> eat bread and cheese for about two months and, and bank the rest of that money. Uh, there's some crazy people out there like that, but then the cat pay, no matter what that is, X amount per day or X amount per week, depending on the position of the person going, because there is, there are different levels there. Um, one of the things I made mention in my note, when you do have a program like that, if you're setting a time limit on it, and let's say you're going to, pay cat pay for the first two months that needs to be clearly um, stated to the entire team that's going out there and if it's going to be pulled because there's no time limit on it you need to also clearly communicate that because that can rub some people the wrong way because I will be honest I've seen people only sign up to go to cats not to help people <laughs> they just want that extra cash and that's just a true reality of, of what people are thinking about when they respond um, some people like the money and to help people but um, you do have to incentivize people to go out there because they're not doing their typical jobs in most um, restoration companies because they're not part of the national team. And the national team already has some other incentivizations that are built into their pay. So it's just something you you pretty much must do. Yeah. Our, so we've actually kind of struggled with this. We Our national team has its normal comp plan that's that's built on, you know, responding to these events. So uh, people that are, are responding outside of their 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 normal work days. We've we've looked at some models, you know, um, where if it's a time and material project, if they're billing overtime, we'll split it with them or we'll give them a percentage of it. And that that's kind of a pay as you go. Um, the other things that we've done is, you know, our ownership um, believes in they love showing up to the job sites and give them what they call them flash bonuses. And, you know, it could be, hey, they're handing you a card that says there's going to be an extra $5,000 on your paycheck this week, or it could be an envelope with $5,000 cash. I mean, our, our, our ownership has been really creative um, through the years and letting us do this in uh, you know, certain ways. But like long extended uh, projects, we've, we've done the overtime split and, and we've had some tr tremendous success with that and, and good feedback. It's, there's, unfortunately, there's not one way to uh, incentivize them all because you know, your, your project manager that's used to doing Mrs. Jones kitchen uh, might struggle handling a large commercial, you know, project. So 
you got to make sure that you're paying everybody apples to apples. And it, it's, it's uh, there's no easy answer for it. You, you just have to look at the financial health of your company. Uh, and, you know, you have to, you have to model it out and say, is this, does this work well for us? Or am I, am I too far on to the employee side? It's, you have to be King Solomon. And, and I personally have not found the one that, that that's plug and play that works in every, every single scenario. I, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm in a different role than Chris, so he, he may have the administrative piece behind him to kind of have a better idea of what works for that, but I, I just, I don't. Yeah, and it usually when we set the cat pay out there, it's for the larger spread events for a very large area that we know we're going to be there for a while. If it's just a small thing, it's not necessarily considered a cat, but it's pretty devastated in certain areas. Those are the kind of things that we think about before we just throw that out there. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, I thought this was an interesting one. This was submitted beforehand, but if you were to scale to a multi-million dollar company and had all the money to hire the right talent, in what order would you hire the support for the company? Oh, that is a good question. That is a good question. I'm going to let you go first, Chris, so I can steal from your answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm just going to throw something out there. Um, I think it depends on you as a person and what you're looking for in your company to be able to really set that. Um, for me, I, I came into this industry as a technician and worked my way through the ranks. So for me, the technicians are the backbone of anyone's company and you need to have a strong mitigation team. Um, and then right after those guys, you got to have a strong project management team. These are the guys that are really in the trenches doing the really the hardest thing. All the other positions come in, they have hard jobs, they have stressful jobs. But sometimes they're in and they're out and they, they might come back in a month. They might come back in two weeks, check in, make sure everything's going. But it's the guys that are in on the operational side that are there day in and day out until that project is finished from start to end. That to me, that's the most important key piece that you want to have, because if they're not good or they don't know what they're doing, you're going to be screwed at the end of the day because they're not doing your documentation. They're not taking good photos. They're not their Their workmanship and craft is not where it should be you're really going to pay if you don't have that up front. Now, a close third, I would say, is the person that is creating th those estimates or those ROMs. If they have no clue about what this industry does or how construction works, <laughs> you're going to have another problem. You're going to be way off base on everything. So having people that truly know this craft, that's what you want to pay good money for. Um, the leadership, other things, that, that comes last to me. You do have to have good leaders, so don't get me wrong. It, it's all dependent on what, what you're looking for. So I'm just going to dovetail with what Chris is saying. For me, the operations piece is operations of production are the most critical component. I I mean, I I tell our sales team, and I'm part of the sales process because I'm, I'm the estimator, but I tell the sales team, you know, it's your job to make the phone ring the first time. It's our operations and production team that's going to make it ring every time after that. So you, you have to sell that job the one time and our production team is going to sell, you know, we're going to get a re repeat, a repeat customer because of that. Um, but when it, so you have the production side, then to me, estimating is, you know, estimating is sets the contract value. It's, it's literally the, the scope of work is the single most important um, piece of paper in the construction management tool. Uh, toolbox. So, so I would go uh, production, estimating, then sales, and then invest in your systems and processes. You know, if you're not using something like Encircle or, or you're not using Matterport or or DocuSketch, or you should really consider investing in, in, in those. If you're not using tool trackers, where you can you know have bar barcode technology, you know those are those are things that are critical to help you. They they help you get paid. Um, so those are all all things that I. I put stock in and, and, you know, the, the mid-level managers are, man, so, so crucial to, to our success as an organization. So I would focus on those things. Yeah. If, if you broke it down into like small teams, like a lead technician, that's really well-trained and then some techs that have some basic knowledge, but they're good. So you get, you're basically looking at your organization as one, two, three of those teams. And then to Chris's point, they're experienced and they're delivering. And then you got a, a, a supervisor who's 
more qualified and, and, and more of an expert. And then a project manager or an ops manager, now that triangle has three teams with a, a big stack of experience. You're going to make more money. You're going to be more efficient. You're going to make better decisions. You're not going to run those costs. So Brian then getting to go say, I can now estimate because I know what the team's production rates are. I know what they're going to do because I've watched them work and I understand where we're going to get in trouble. Most people that hire on the front line, a junior person with one course, and you think that your entire company's going to run smooth, you're, but like that's where we get into trouble is that restoration is so complex and so hard to learn that if you have the experience, you can make a lot of money in it because you can see all the opportunities. But if you don't have the experience, it's really hard to see the, what needs to happen. You haven't made the mistakes of finding out or you haven't had someone show you where the mistakes are. You lose a lot of money in making those mistakes or those inefficiencies. So I would agree with these guys is operations is number one. Uh, sales number or sorry, uh, estimating is number two. You can actually put estimating as number one because you can offset your price of your job for the inexperience of your teams, but it's really hard to keep selling. And then sales three and leadership and everything else that comes with it. It's good to have, but you can see some poor organizations with poor leadership make money. Uh, but if I were spending my money, that's that's the order I'd put them in. Hard hard to make money with a bad leader because you won't have the turnover. Uh, you have to be hiring and, and rehiring. Great answers, guys. Um, next one, how do you hold crews accountable for lack of documentation? And how do you explain that documentation is one of the most important things to present to a carrier to cover the company as a whole when it comes to proving your numbers? I'll, I'll start because I was harsh. I'm, I'm the guy who put our teams on the road a little longer than they should be. Um, for us, if we weren't getting paid on those, I lost, like that was a, a, a that was a no-go zone for us. Um, you lose your job if you weren't doing it. That, that, to us, that was one of the most critical things for us was documentation. Those that didn't document, we were on them. Like, if you're technically good, but you could care less about protecting the company, we can't make money. So you put us in, what happens is the front end of our business got so lax or, or if they didn't focus on documenting the back end workload had to go up so much that the back end was struggling with adjusters, upset clients caused too much stress. So on the front you do, this is your job. Your job is documenting. Then your job is restoring. And we just went with a hard, hard line and, and I'm believing it. And then believed it so much. I came to the circle. I was like, I think everyone should do this, but that's, that's the, uh, if you don't do it, your your back end of your office, your your admin teams, they're going to be swamped in, in paperwork. And we've seen that time and time again. So let me play devil's advocate real fast. So um, I do agree with what you said, Chris. And I say I'm going to use a cattle prodder to hold people accountable. Um, for me personally, I, I do feel accountability is one of the biggest things. But something that everyone needs to do before they need to understand the situation yep. and always look first at what what have I done in this situation if these are my direct reports have I overloaded them and given them more than they can actually handle and they are too afraid to say it because I've been in those situations before so sometimes they just physically they can't get to it all because you entrusted them with too much because you don't have enough personnel out there to do it so then that's when you need to come in and help them get through that or give them what they need. Um, but outside of those kind of situations, I agree with Chris 100%. You have to toe a line. You have to have accountability there or it will continue to happen and you will lose big time. For us, uh, project documentation, um, site safety, OSHA standards, things like that, that's all incorporated into their, uh, into their compensation packages. So if, if for some reason, uh, the um, documentation is deficient. There's an impact to their incentive plan, uh, not their not their base salary, but their you know their the each each bonus is eligible for incentives. And if if they have not done a, a thorough and accurate, thorough job of documenting, um, it it impacts them. It, so they're not uh, you know like each thing is weighted. So like documentation may be ten percent of the bonus plan uh, bonus plan for them. Well, if, it, if they take a hit on that and they lose 10%, that's that's 10% of their bonus. And, and our guys, some of our project managers are eligible for pretty significant bonuses based on 
on the profitability um, factor. So, you know, if there's a chance for them to receive a twenty thousand dollar bonus, losing two thousand dollars of it, that kind of lights a fire in them. So it's kind of a the carrot and the stick method. But but you're sharing the risk. So you're saying if you don't document, we take on more risk. We're going to take the the risk out of your compensation to cover for the the monies we're not going to get. Which at the end of the day, your your staff have to understand. And I think that's the disconnect we talked about a little bit before. You're rushing to do the job technically correct. Documentation is a business decision that we need you to do, and uh, and that's why it's, it was so uh, so forced in our companies. That's great, thanks, guys. Um, next one: When do you pivot when you find that the cat loss is costing more money than you will be making, or is there a solution? <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Because usually at that point, you're already fully committed to that job. You better find a way to stop the bleeding and and <laughs> make some drastic changes to see if you can salvage that project to give you a quick answer. Yeah, I, there, there's not a there's not an easy way to do it. I mean, it's you, you just that's why you have to know your your you know your weekly cash burns and to to know if you're really upside down on a project. And I mean. We have never walked away from, I don't, and I'm, I don't know that you guys, I've never heard of you guys walking away from anything, but it's, it's just, once you're in there, you're, it's like the old thing about being, you're somewhat pregnant. You, you either are, or you're not. And yeah. um, it, it's hard when a project is going south, it's really hard to write it. And sometimes, sometimes you have to make a, a, a management change and you know, those are, you lose continuity when you're doing that and it, it's tough. So, you know, you got to set yourself up for success and make sure that you got the right project manager for the right, you know, for the right scenario. Um, you know, if, if, and if you don't, you're behind the eight ball uh, from the start and it's, you're, you're never going to catch up. And so you have to, in my mind, do I look at, man, if I just recover all my costs, is that going to be a winning job for us? Or if I, I make 5% on it, is that, is that going to be a winning project for us? So that's, you have to you have to look deep within yourself to make sure that you, you can answer that question. Actually, yeah. and if, if you if you were to take that and put it in, or if you're losing on a big job, that's one thing. If you're out on a cat and you've got a lot of little jobs and you start seeing your margins coming down, it's probably time to sit down with your team and and do a you slow it down so you can get fast again, but you have to slow down and and figure out why you're you're all of a sudden sliding normally. I think Brian touched on it. Your scopes are, are now falling farther and farther behind. You're rushing. You're not capturing the information you need to write good scopes to capture the right estimates or to get the right numbers down, or you're not doing your paperwork, which is leading to you're, you're doing work, but you're not charging for it. You know, that's, that's why I'm a big fan of rate material in the field because you can capture it. You know, you're making a set margin on that. Uh, if you get into unit prices and you miss it, it it's pretty hard to play catch up after that. Yeah, and your teams might be burnt out at that point, and you haven't seen it yet, and you're going to find out very quickly. Uh, next question here. So how do you handle jobs where you have a signed contract with the customer, begin the work, and the insurance company hires a consultant and everything changes? They want to change the scope of the job midstream. Document, 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 and notify everybody that the, that the consultant is changing. The, the scope of work uh, and then and that gives you the opportunity to reevaluate your ROM and, and update all the interested parties. Um, you know, you, you have to keep the material interested parties on, on both sides of the wall, you know, whether it be the owner and then the claim side, you, you gotta, you gotta notify them when, when there's going to be an increase and even really a decrease in the ROM and, and let them identify why. And if it's from a consultant that's, and you know, it's best to collaborate with the consultants. I know sometimes we don't, you know, it can be a very adversarial thing, but you know, they have, some of them have a tremendous amount of experience and they may have seen something, they may have ran into a similar project uh, in another area and, and they may have uh, some insights that, that, you know, you're not looking at. Um, sometimes it brings some out of the box thinking and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if something's gonna change based on what the consultant says, you know, because remember, you've met with the you've met with your owners before the consultants ever showed up, so you know what the priorities of the of the client is. 
you know, the priorities of the, what the building is and you know what the project priorities are. And so you, you got to get an alignment on those. And if, if the uh, consultant is telling you something else, well, you need to try to figure out a way to bring alignment to it, or you have to, you have to call it out for what it is. It's, it's different from what, what the owner wanted and, and uh, just document why you're doing it and, and proceed. And, but you got to make sure everybody knows why things are changing. And I think if they're definitely adding to the scope of work, that's amazing. <laughs> Let's keep going. If they're reducing it, find out why. I mean, if they're coming in way after things have acclimated, uh, they're two weeks behind and they're not seeing walls being wet where the surface of the walls are dry, but we know something's going on inside the wall cavity and they're basing it simply off of that. You may have to bring in an industrial hygienist or someone else. There's really no telling, but there's got to be a lot more conversations. But Brian hit the nail on the head by saying you have to document it. Every day you send, if you're doing daily re um, reporting to all interested parties, you definitely need to have every detail in there. These were the people that were on the job site. These were the people and what was being said and what they've asked us to do. That also tells a story down the line. So documentation again is paramount. Yeah, and you know, they're bringing in all kinds of consultants as well. If, you know, don't, don't ever hesitate to bring in, an, uh, like we really rely on industrial hygienists, uh, you know, all over and, you know, if it's a regional cat, you know, make sure you have a relationship with somebody that's outside that area because they may become overloaded with work. And so, you know, you can bring somebody in from outside the area if you have to, or when you're going to uh, a national event, you know, it's okay to have a relationship with somebody and to feed them work because they may be, have the opportunity to feed you work later on. And they may be able to whisper in, in somebody's ear, hey, look, this, the contractor you're working with is not, you know, not not where they should be for this time in the project and it might give, help you get your foot in the door that way um so you know if you guys want we you know we rely on a couple uh, i'm just like a blue sky team does so if anybody needs recommendations you know shoot me an email and, and i'll give you some national con, uh, companies that we've had great success with yeah well, one part I wanted to say on that, it triggered a response of something I meant to say earlier, but depending on which state you're working in or you're going to a cat, Texas, Florida, make sure you have the right training, certifications, licenses. All of those things are extremely important. But even with industrial hygienists, which Brian's mentioning, you may have to consider, please test for asbestos and lead. That's something that people forget about. Don't Don't be that guy. Make sure you test for those kind of things too in advance. And the the last piece I wanted to say, because I know we're we're nearing the end and I don't know how much further we're pushing. Somebody told me once and it really stuck to me is that a rising tide raises all ships. So we're all out here. Yeah, we may joke around and say this person's our competitor. Ah, we don't have any competitors, whatever you might say. But at the end of the day, all of us restorers, we need to work together to help each other improve no matter what we're doing. So I know I don't always have all the answers. Brian would probably say the same thing. Chris, he knows all the answers, but anyways, uh, there's someone out there that does know when you don't. So don't be afraid to reach out. That's a great point, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just wrap it up with one more question. Um, so what, are the key areas where contractors lose money on cats and how do you avoid them? If you guys can answer this in the last couple minutes here, I know it's a big one. That's, it can be an easy one. So sometimes with documentation and it's something that we somewhat touched on, but didn't really, if you think about it, photos say a thousand words. If you're taking appropriate photos, I have seen too many jobs where we did not have enough photos or good quality photos that we missed out on being able to charge for certain things. So photos are extremely important or just overall not documenting every little thing that you did. Some people can come in and be like, I got my labor hours, I got my air movers and my dehumidifiers, but you forgot your, um, your fall arrest systems that you could be charging for, your small tools, all these other things that you need to be thinking about. Um, time and materials, every little thing costs something. And that's usually where things go wrong because people aren't itemizing every little thing that you're doing or utilizing. Yeah, and 
hidden margin erosion is, is just the biggest deal that you don't think about, you know, the carrying costs for your working capital uh, or, you know, hitting your line of credit, the mobilization costs, uh, you know, those, those are just things that people really don't uh, take into account. And have you, are you going through the exercise to make sure that your rate schedule is in alignment with what your vendors are charging? You know, if like, we try to make a higher percentage on a profitability on our equipment rates than we do on labor rates, because we, first of all, we own a lot of gear, but we have favorable terms with all of our suppliers so that we know, generally we're, we know that we're going to maintain the same, uh, a, a same um, profitability goal on rented equipment, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the nation. So we do we really do fine tune our our rate schedule so that we know what our what our profitability is going to hit, going into the event. Yeah, one thing you, 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 said, you said profit erosion, and I, it's probably a big one. Also, buying your gear when you're buying your gear, don't buy it right at the cat time. It's, it helps if you have a capex plan. Buy it when it's on sale. Buy it off season, not when everyone else is trying to get gear and be like, hey, can I get a deal? No, you're not getting a deal. You get a premium. Yeah, buy it when you can actually get it because cat events, right. it gobbles it all up. Yeah. So one thing I was going to mention, because uh, Brian mentioned mobilizations and being able to charge for that, there's a, a couple jobs every once in a while where you may have to stop work, demobilize, mobilize, demobilize, and do it two or three times. You've got to have that written down too, because that tells a whole different story of what's taking place on that job, and you got to be paid for those items. Hey guys, well, yeah, one other question: What do you deal with on like when job starts and you've got forty people on a job, and then you hit a, a delay, and those forty people are in market? How are you? How, you know, that's another part where if you're not tight on your contract, you could not only a road margin, you can lose it all. Uh, how do you guys handle those those? uncontrollable stops or breaks in the work for whatever reason. So it's the standby time is actually in our contract. I literally started to mention standby time after when Chris had stopped speaking, but um, so that that's actually written into our, our, our uh, contract portal to portal time is written into our contract. That's, you know, if you're having to stay two hours outside away from the job because you can't find any hotels, you know, that's four hours of travel time that, that, that gets billed. You know, that you're going to incur that cost you're going to be paying for it so make sure you track all of that stuff separately and you know uh when you mentioned about doing you know collecting four checks up front that's to to follow up with what josh said you know if the insurance company is willing to do that for you you know be there's they're giving it to you they want something in exchange for that too so be prepared to you know instead of charging 10 and 10 on on lodging maybe you only charge five percent because they're paying you you know once a once a week. Um, so just, you know, everything's kind of a two-way street. You know, if if you're paying out something, you want something in return. If you're collecting something, you know, they're going to want something in return. So just just be mindful of, of that. So how are you guys, sorry, Brooke, I'm going to just jump in here. How are you guys handling, you, you know, a lot of owners get personal on when you get into negotiations, like I, I should be paid for this, but you're looking at it as, Hey, it's a give and take. How do you take the emotion out of it? Right? Like you, you're coming in with an open mind of being willing, but how do you take the emotion out of it so you can make good decisions, make good, good barters in, in that process? Well, you're, you're asking the wrong guy. If you're asking me that question, I, I, I struggle with that. I don't, it's, I, I take it. Sometimes I'd get it a little too personal. I, mean, I take it personal. Like, Hey, you're attacking, you're attacking me. You're not attacking the process. So I, I'm going to defer to Chris because he seems much more calm than I am. Yeah. I can't be calm, but I'm also a ginger, so uh, let's be honest there. But um, no, the, the biggest thing is at the end of the day, there there has to be a little bit of give and take because can, consultants want to come in and they're going to ask for concessions and certain things. And sometimes we can we can accommodate that. Other times it's way too much asking for and you just have to have it documented. But there can't always be be give and take. If you've already done your absolute best as a professional in this industry to build fairly for everything. Um, I know there's conversations about an exact amount estimate and having fluff in it or whatever it might be. Don't have the fluff. Just write your estimate, have it true to what it's going to be. And you're making your margin. And everything's good. And I think that's kind of where we've gotten to this situation in the industry where we are having to 
have concessions and all this because people are not writing estimates fairly. So there's a lot to it. That's the best answer I could get for that question because we can go round and round on that one, right, Brian? Yeah, no, I agree. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us on this webinar. Um, this was a really great session. Chris, if you don't mind sharing the screen, I just have a couple of resources I wanted to uh, share with the group. The first one, um, yeah, this is everyone's contact info. And then on the next slide, um, you can scan the QR code on the screen to download our emergency prep kit has a bunch of interactive PDFs that you can fill out for your own team um, and you can use those to prep for cat season. And then everyone who attends is gonna be sent our cat readiness playbook. So that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then on the next slide, we have a couple upcoming events. Sorry, Brooke. No problem. You're a slow operator on this end. <laughs> So our, our next event is actually tomorrow. So we have an event with Sanctum. So we'll discuss uh, KPIs you should set and monitor for sales reps in the restoration industry. And then we have a water damage Q&A with Ken Larson as well. So uh, thank you everyone so much for attending. As mentioned, you'll get a copy of the recording tomorrow and you can claim your ICRC credits on the on-demand version as well. But thanks so much to this panel. Um, we really appreciate your time and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, gentlemen.